Welcome to the Sons of Liberty podcast, coming to you from the Liberty Tree Studio in San Antonio, Texas, where we discuss topics of the day, firearms, great food, and even better whiskey. Grab a drink, sit down with your host, the founding daddies, Mike Mahalski and Kyle Grothus. Hi right, guys, welcome to the uh, SOLGW, SOLGW podcast with uh, Mike and Kyle. And we have our guests here with us today. We have Kevin Brittingham and we have uh, Nick Boras. And uh, we'll let them say a little about themselves. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm Kevin. I'm a big fan of the longtime fan, first time caller. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> What's your sign? <laughs> yeah. Like long walks on the beach. Yeah. No, you guys are cool. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I do gun stuff as well. Everybody knows who Kevin is. I don't think we get That's your, fucking right. Your right. representation precedes you, so. <laughs> For better or worse, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so I'm Nick Boris. I'm one of the owners of Reptilia. We make um, accessories, scope mounts, stocks, grips, stuff like that. Uh, my business partner, Eric, and I got our start years ago at Magpul. Um, so I've known Kevin for about 15, 16 years. He was kind of one of the people that brought me up in the industry and mentored Aww. me. So. Aww. Love all my children. You're inspiring. Very, very oh, now I feel like I have to say something. Yeah. So I had a company called Advanced Armament Corporation. Sold it to Remington. And I was at SIG a couple of years. And I started a company called Q in 2016. So we make the honey badger and the fix and stuff. I love your branding, dude. <laughs> yeah. So Thank you. But a lot of people don't know this, but I, I give a lot of uh, a lot of credit to the to the folks I always looked up to whenever I was coming up. Um, and the very first NFA item I ever owned was the SDN6, mm-hmm. the, the AAC SDN6. Me too. And I remember the the branding, like the box. I remember looking at uh, photos of like just y'all's, y'all's building and that culture. And I, honestly, I don't know if you can see some of the influence here, but, uh, you know. It's yeah, I love it. I love what you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big fans, man. Well, wow. thank you. Yeah. Back then, everything was very serious with guns. It was very serious. And I got really sick of that. And so I wanted us to be different, but you know, it was authentic. I, I've always loved skateboarding. I still have a half pipe and skate. I've loved that culture and guns. It was just so, I don't know, like, I don't know. It was like macho and lame to me at the time. Well, but, but our industry, I've, and I've noticed this, and this is why we've done things a lot differently. And that's why I think we've always been kind of industry outsiders in a sense, but uh, it's so sterile. Like everything is so sterile in the gun industry. And I think it's like this attempt to be the gray man. And I can honestly tell you from just my travels of doing some of my activism and uh, my, you know, the two a kind of thing, uh, no matter what we do, we will never appease the other side. So you might as well kind of push in for your your side in the sense of, and have a little bit of fun with it. We don't it doesn't have to be so sterile. Yeah, I don't know why it's, it's because we make firearms. Everything has to be serious all the time. I want to have fun at work every day. Yeah. I want to have a good time, and it doesn't mean you don't take it seriously, and we don't take the technology and our product seriously. But yeah, I, I want to have fun and laugh. <laughs> that's kind of yeah. part. Of, that's kind of our motto. It's like we take our product extremely seriously. We don't take ourselves all that seriously at all. <laughs> no, <Not> yeah, <laughs> fair enough. So I think one of the things that you touched on was the history and kind of the early NFA stuff. You guys had your first NFA item was a SDN six, right? Mm-hmm. The thing that really comes up time after time in the silencer industry is he really kind of revolutionized silencers for the commercial market. It created the entire market. It was such a niche thing that before AAC, no one knew how to get a silencer. Yeah, yeah, you definitely brought so, it into the brought well, it into the mainstream. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I became passionate about silencers and thought everybody should have one. So. What, what, and where did that come from, though? Why, I mean, where did the where did that come from to think that silencers should be completely normalized? I'm sure. I'm sure. Like the our people can probably guess why, but. You know, well, for me, you know, I didn't grow up with guns or anything. Uh, you know, it wasn't part of my life growing up. My family wasn't into hunting or shooting or anything. Um, but as a teenager, I got to shoot a gun with a silencer and it, it was with uh, some Navy SEALs. And the only gun that they had that had a silencer was the MP5 SD. And so I got to shoot that gun and it just I didn't understand why all the other guns didn't have them. and It was loud. And so, you know, it's probably just that exposure. And I think I probably started my company that day. Like that, that's what drove me. It didn't make sense to me they weren't on all guns. Then you discover, oh, well, it's difficult to do a good silencer. And 
It's just kind of how it happened. Did, did uh, you, you do you do a lot of work with Silencer sh- uh, Silencer Shop, right? Yeah, yeah. So I remember going to his house, the founder's house, Dave. Yeah, yeah it was whenever he was still operating out of his house. I remember walking in, and there was floor. That's actually where I got my SDN six. Oh, it is. And, yeah, and so there, it was floor to ceiling silencers in, the, in his living room. But that's another story of a guy that. Um, his son had a hearing. Yeah, uh, born deaf in one ear. Yeah, yeah, and so he, so, so because he, they like to shoot, and he didn't want to, uh, you know, accelerate any kind of hearing damage. That's what got him into the silencer game, and now he's the largest silencer retailer, I think, in the world. I mean, it's neat to hear yeah, how these things happen. Be, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I would say, and and to me, to even add to that, Dave Matheny is yeah. who you're talking about. I think he's one of the most innovative people in our industry during you know my 30 year tenure so far. He's made a bigger impact. Than most anyone else you know just it, you know and his was just process like why is this process so difficult what are the actual rules what can we do to make it easier and he should really be honored i think in the stuff that silencer shop has done you know, to make the process real mainstream yeah yeah i mean just just like that kiosk we have down there i mean you can come and get your yeah. fingerprints done right does everything i've never quite figured out why it doesn't take your picture but i mean it does pretty much everything else for you <laughs> i mean it's it's incredible on the technology yeah. side, the stuff he's yeah. done, like you said, to make it make it easier, make anybody can walk in and do it. Well, you know? Just not accepting what everyone would say. I know a hurdle that I ran into early on in my career was I would go into a gun store to try to sell our silencers, and half the FFLs thought silencers were illegal. Yeah. And so they just take everything at face value. And, you know, Dave is a smart guy, and he actually read the regulations. And if it was a gray area or it didn't specify, hey, the police department has to do the fingerprints or whatever, he would ask the government and, you know, he started working with the FBI, I guess, to do the fingerprints so that yeah. his machine could be approved. And, you know, he just took a lot of risk and made, really made it mainstream. So yeah, I appreciate your kind words, but I think Dave Matheny is the one that's made silencers mainstream. Yeah. yeah. There's, but between, but yeah, between you guys for sure. I mean, just to come in more, how much bigger the suppressor industry's got, or like it says, as long as we've been in 10 years, I mean, they're, they're everywhere now, you know, there was hardly, there's hardly anything back then. So, right. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think, uh, after advanced armament and silencer co really grew, you know, within five or 10 years, it was 10 times bigger than it was, yeah. you so, know, when I was last at advanced armament. So I had a small, uh, contribution to the to silencer, uh, ownership here in Texas. Um, have you ever partied so hard that you got a state law rewritten? <laughs> Because, mm. elaborate. <laughs> because I have. Uh-huh. So I, I, I was actually arrested in Austin, Texas, and I was charged with possession of a prohibited weapon. And I was I was taking a I was taking a suppressed uh, <laughs> STN six. I was taking a suppressed rifle from my room to go put it in the trunk of our vehicles. We were having guests up to the hotel room, and the very first person that I had uh, encountered as I got off the elevator was an Austin Police Department uh, an Austin cop. And uh, he saw the rifle, and I mean, bolts locked to the rear. There's no mag. I'm holding it by the butt. I mean, I'm, it's, just, it's, it's, it's it's the most unthreatening possible way to, to handle a gun. And I thought nothing of it. I just walked by, like, "Hey, how you doing?" Because I mean, we work with police officers. You know, we're we're in this culture. You know. And uh, anyways, he looks at the gun and he he asked me. He's like, he's like, "Is that a silencer?" And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I thought he was, I thought it was like, wow, that's cool. You know, like, yeah. No, I got arrested for possession of a prohibited weapon. And the way that the law worked back then, you had um, a defense to prosecution. So they could arrest you, seize your property, and take it. And then you'd have your day in court to which you could prove your innocence. Well, that's not the way the American justice. You're, you know, it's the state's job to prove your guilt. It's not your, the onus isn't for you to prove your innocence. So I was, it, it took eight months. Even though they had all of the tax stamps, my FFL, my SOT, all that kind of good stuff, uh, it took it took eight months. They finally gave him begrudgingly gave my property back, and then I was so uh, kind of pissed off at the whole process that Todd Radner, NFA, yeah. the, the NFA Freedom oh, Alliance. Yeah. So Todd and I got together. He lobbied and he got them to reform defense to prosecution. It's now removed from the books. Okay, you, you cannot just arrest somebody for having a silencer. Unless, like, you for some reason could know that it was, you know, um, completely illegal. But now in Texas, the defense of prosecution is gone. It is no longer a burden. The burden is not on the citizen to prove their innocence. So, like, hmm. in some kind of weird, weird way, you're welcome, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That sucks. It's a sucky way for you to learn that. 
Well, yeah, it was it was a it was an embarrassing thing, you know. I mean, it was a I had to come back and like, where's your stuff? I'm like, well, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so what are you guys doing down here? We all what are y'all in town for? I. Uh, I don't know. I, I know what I you're doing. The name of it. It's uh, uh, Mission, Mission Ridge. Ridge. Yeah, Mission Ridge is one of our dealers uh, down here. So we're down doing an event with Q. So it should work out pretty well. Yeah, so people get to come by and see the product, shoot the product. So brought the boom box, our new 8.6 gas gun. That thing is awesome. That's yeah. cool. That thing is so cool. I, I'm jealous. I, I hate to say it, that thing's, thing's really cool. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we did that. We did it last year with Mission Ridge. You know, I like the grassroots stuff, and it's probably when I was a kid working in a gun store. I, I like th that aspect of the business. And I don't typically like how our products and things are distributed in our industry. And I like a better connection with the gun store and ranges. So when we have these and I'm in town, so I push our sales guys to go do these things, put our stuff in front of customers, be able to talk to them about it. And then when I'm in town, I love going to them. Because, you know, it's the only time that stuff's not filtered. You know, and you can go online and see stuff, but that, you know, half of everything on there is such bullshit. And But talking to people firsthand, letting them tell you what they like and don't like about the products or what's going on in the industry, I enjoy that part of it still. It, yeah, it, you it, can't replicate that in a brochure. You know? Exactly yeah. right. And to Kevin's point on this, one of the frustrations I think a lot of us have in the industry is we don't have direct connection to the guy that's laying his credit card down. Yeah. So oftentimes it goes through distribution, then to a dealer, then to the, the guy that is actually you know, earning his money and paying for your, your product, we don't talk to them enough. So these events are an opportunity to go and ch chat with the guy who saved up his money and he's literally laying his credit card down for your product right there. The information you learn is awesome and valuable. No, events like that are great, man. I'm sorry, sorry anybody listening to the podcast, you missed it. It was probably two weeks ago. Exactly. <laughs> so, probably, so, yeah. like, so we, we, we can I'm a, we can edit this, right, if we have to. Like, he's hungry. When can we get him to come grab his bottle so he can yeah, go yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you know what, it's just I'm getting company called and this podcast. I think it's really good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it doesn't seem it seemed highly inappropriate for me to do it. Yeah. Do you think I should have done that? I should have come and say twenty four on fucking cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to do the? Yeah, do it. 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 I got another one. You want to sit down? Somewhere? Oh, no, no, he. he, 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 he yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a walk up ball. Let's bring him. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> 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 Can you get through? Yeah. Yeah. Go. No, Oops, sorry, sorry. Sincerely, I think it is really, it's all really good. And it, I was thinking that it is. Just okay. It seems, it seems so no, no, hey, we're going we're gonna to have you on a whole podcast here as soon as you're cleared hot, man. So. Okay. I'll leave you to it. Go, yeah, yeah, go ask for Tom down there. Yeah, go, go, go get Tom and go, lunch, go get some yeah. lunch, man. Yeah, okay, perfect. so we'll see you in a bit. Sounds good, mate. Hey, yeah, I'll work here. I'll stay here Nick and Eric, they get so British anytime they're around here, they're British friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. Like, we start using the C word way too frequently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just go get some trouble. Tea. What? The C word. Uh, <laughs> I believe the word's cunt. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I forgot. We're on the Sun Delivery podcast. We had an Australian guy, that was like probably one of the best armorers I've ever seen in my life, work here. His name was Scotty. And everybody that knows us from like the early days knows Scotty. And uh, yeah, he used the word cunt like a comma like he actually he, like, he could somehow work it into anything and it sounded like natural it didn't yeah. even sound offensive it sounded like he, even in a grantham video saying it yeah yeah he, he's throwing go to the yeah. stock he comes <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny hey, how did you guys get your start dude so well it's a it's a couple of stories so i was building guns in my garage for uh like team guys and marines my buddies you know out in the west coast believe it or not and uh I, I mean, I, it started getting kind of a popular thing, and, and 
after I, I building ARs, building ARs, yeah. I was building ARs in my garage. And this was after I had taken like a class with Will Larson, and I had always been super mechanically curious about guns in terms of materials and the techniques and every weapon I saw. It's like we were talking about earlier. There's something I would do a little different, you yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. And so at the time, I was looking at like your real high performance brands that legitimately improved the 6920. I thought at the time that was Daniel Defense, that was Nevesky. Um, you know, you had um, Knights Armament. And you know, and, but these these guys were legitimately making a Colt 6920 a better gun. There was they weren't they weren't going the other direction, which a lot of this industry unfortunately has. So I started I started with you know I went to Will Larson class, he's my mentor. And this is a decade ago, about uh, it's about fourteen years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when I start I start building guns in my garage. Well, I got a visit from the ATF. And the ATF was like the first committee. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the ATF yeah. was like, "Listen, fucker." Uh, they, <laughs> they showed up with every forty four seventy three I'd ever filled out in my entire life. So if you don't think there's a registry, you're out of your mind. Okay, like there is a registry because they showed up with guns that I had bought in like my my twenty first birthday. You know, and I was, I was in my mid thirties at the time. So, you know, anyways, I got a visit from ATF, and they told me, "Hey, knock it off. This is your one warning. You need to go get a license." And somehow, serendipitously, like that was around the same time, a mutual friend introduced Kyle and I, yeah. and that, and like he wanted to get in the gun business too. And I didn't have a choice, you know. Neither did my, my neither did my dog. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we ended up getting together. Yeah, yeah I, I had the space, you know, I had the, the business background. So for those of y'all who don't know, I have another business, Lumberyard. So this is our second building we've had, but the, both were on uh, our Lumberyard property. Right. Adam shut the other one down, and we needed more space, so we moved here. Um, so yeah, I had basically was like a bunker. It was, we had an old Goodwill facility that we had turned into a lumber yard. One of the back warehouses had like a bunker in it. I don't know what the hell they use it for. I'm a little, you know, when I toured that place when we bought it, it was very strange, like Goodwill distribution center. It's like going to a concentration camp. There's like a, like a shoe room. It was really weird. Either way, uh, we had this bunker and yeah, it was, it was very, uh, the first, you know, we did a little work on it, what we could replace some of the electrical and stuff, yeah. but it was, uh, the very first thing we had in there it was not a workbench. It was a bar. The yep. very first thing we built in there was a bar. <laughs> you still have it. Hey, you know, it, it just check it out. It's also a workbench. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 a yeah, lot yeah. of work was done on that bench. <laughs> 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 I was gonna say, don't tell me what my bar is. Dude, it was a lot of things yeah. back then. We ate lunch on it. We did everything. Yeah. It, was, it was actually in the shop. Like we were building guns next isn't to it, the bar. Isn't it strange as like the business grows? Like those are really the great times. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Like my company's growing a, a lot right now, and everybody. Mm-hmm. All the guys that were there in the beginning are like, shit, I missed the beginning. You know, in the beginning is the hard time because it's when you're having to do all that stuff and you're working 80 hours a week and everybody has to do five jobs. And I would tell the guys back then when they would complain, I would be like, five years from now, you guys are going to be wishing. Like, I've been through this once before. Yeah. These are really the great times. Right? It, it's 100%, man. Like, there was – you were – you didn't have as many eyes on you. You, you kind of did uh, – you, you, you had a lot of fun with it. It, like, it was weird for us. Whenever we eat, like as the company grew and evolved, and we went from three employees to ten to twenty to fifty, and then you start growing. Then I, I remember the introduction of like the official Sons of Liberty employee handbook, and I'm thinking <laughs> back to like you know whenever like we were throwing flashbangs at each other yeah. in the shop, like in the first week. I'm like, well, how the hell? Did this happen? Yeah, yeah. I be- I've become my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you know, some of the more surreal moments I can remember in the past, like the first time we sold a gun online. Yeah, when we went to Shot Show the first time. We saw a guy in Dorsey that bar. It wasn't Dorsey at the time, at the bar in the Venetian. We saw a guy wearing our shirt, and we look at each other. We're like, "Do you know that guy?" And he's like, "No." Do you know that guy? We're like, "No." And like, we saw a dude that we had no personal connection with wearing our shirt. We're like, yeah. "That's awesome." Those are such cool moments, yeah, and it's yeah. not the things you think about at the time, but in retrospect, those are always the cool things. Like when you guys bring up the 762 SDN6 is your first thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember doing that. And, you know, like, the, the Navy SEALs actually named that silencer. That's why the Navy really? N6, we didn't even name it. And, like, that was an actual specialized thing for them. We were able to sell it commercially. But, you know, those things, I'm like, for me, that seems like 10 years ago. Yeah. And I'm like, ah. Oh. But just yeah. all these little moments, you're right, where I started doing shirts back in the day when you talk about, like, our marketing is because I would get free gun shirts all the time, but I would pay $20 for skateboard T-shirts because all the gun shirts were lame. And then when I started working a lot with special operations, and, you know, you think, like, not having that background, like, oh, they're all the same way. And what I realized is, well, hell, at the time I was 30, 
these guys are my age and they like motocross and they like skateboarding and he grew up surfing and they like the same shit I do. So I started doing I mean, like the box your SDN six came in. Mm -hmm. I actually that Statue of Liberty with a gun with a silencer, I did for an army unit that lost someone and I did that drawing for them. Really? And, oh, I, did, cool. and I did t-shirts for them and the guy's uh, widow, they gave her like some of the t-shirts. I did it for their team and gave her some of the t-shirts. And so she got attached to that and they called me like six months later and wanted more. And I was like, well, I just kind of did them for that thing. It's like, well, his wife, it's all she wears and wow. she's wearing them out and she wants them. So I was like, okay. So I said, well, then I'll just do them and make them and sell them and I'll send you guys a bunch, which I did. And then they, for them, the silencers, they got a bunch of silencers around this time and I made the boxes just for them. Wow. So theirs will be delivered with that logo on it. But then the box was cool, and it turned into, like, this logo for us in the box. But it's interesting. Your first silencer, like, two of the most elite groups in the world. The silencer was for them and named by them. And then the box and that logo was for the other unit. That's awesome. And, and those where those things came from. You know, and so, like, you say these things, stuff I don't even think about for years. Yeah, that's the one. Wow. And um, I don't because the original one for them didn't have the advanced armament and all across the dude, top. It was just the statue. With the I, I still I still have that box, dude. I had, that was one of the yeah. first gun shirts I owned. I wore. I, I think my ex wife threw it away because I wore it till it had holes in it. Yeah, That's yeah. So but, funny. but you know, you guys say these, and I start thinking about. But it's all those cool things like you're saying. The first time you see somebody wearing your shirt, because it got peeps. As our company started to grow, people would ask me for shirts, and I'm like, well, I can't afford to give everybody a t-shirt, and it's like I got to sell them. And I felt like a douche selling them, but it's like, well. If we're going to sell it, and that's where I started doing all these different logos and stuff for my old company, because it would have to be a shirt that I would pay for. Otherwise, I don't feel right taking your money for it. And that's when I did the restroom logo. That became one of them. Um, you know, dozens and dozens yeah. of different logos <clears throat> and stuff. The NBA logo, I did that like 20 years ago. And See, like, that's an awesome one. It was yeah, super cool. Spurs. Like, <laughs> so and I now started Mac Bull. For it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, back in the day, Mac Bull was still, like, almost unknown. And to the point where I'm looking at all your stickers on the door over here, we had to add the word Mac Bull to the sticker itself because people kept mounting it upside down. So even though Mac Bull is so <laughs> prolific right now, it, we, you know, it's yeah. synonymous with guns. It was not at the time, even though we were a pretty big company. So, like, when you started seeing it on cars that was the right way up, you're like, okay, we're, we're making progress. People, people get it now. Yeah, Dude, but, like, but, but sometimes like, whenever you're communicating to like our end user, the kind of person that like wants a silencer, the kind of person that wants a good hardcore, you know, endurance rifle, like some of that branding, you know, it, 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 it not being sterile, I think helped like the helped relate to a lot of folks, you know, yeah. it, it was so, it, it was, I remember like that was, it was so different at the time. It, it wasn't just, now I get it. We, we have a sterile arm of the company that just does like some of your more sterile stuff. I get it. There's a time and a place, but at the same time, like, I mean, our, you know, the, like our friends, the people we all kind of grew together with that, that logo for us means something, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not just a, a gun brand logo. It also says something about what you believe. Like I, I bet I can guess where you stand on certain things whenever yeah. I see somebody wear that. Yeah. You have one of our first 50 guns, you know, we hadn't had a professional draw the logo yet. So I drew it and it looks like, like a mentally damaged person drew it. That can't draw. <laughs> and but there's a few of those guns out there. I really want one back. If you have one, call me. Uh, yeah, we, we burst with your hand drawn logo. On. Yeah. yeah we, we, nice. we buy those back. When we see one come across, I'll trade you a brand new rifle. Like, uh, like the most advanced rifle we currently make for that or if you want to sell it to us we'll do that but like if we can find this i would love to get them back they rainier rainier rails on them the one that's the and that's funny too another thing is like you know back then we bought a lot of stuff from rainier arms and now we sell yeah. stuff to rainier arms the other way around yep. yeah right but yeah it's 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 the same logo it just looks it, it's like yeah like a <laughs> <laughs> like it was done on crayon. Yeah, like, yeah. A, like a damaged person traced it, basically. Well, 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 <laughs> you know, that's similar to the logo that I did um, at Advanced Armament in the sense it was the skull and cross guns. And, you know, I realized I, I'd never even been on the Internet till after I graduated college and I'd had my company a few years. And I thought I didn't understand the Internet, thought the name needed to be very descriptive. But after years of writing out Advanced Armament Corporation or typing it out, like if I ever have another company, it's going to have a simple name. And another thing is like the logo, I would come up with all these <laughs> yeah. logos, but AAC, like that doesn't mean anything and it sounds stupid. So we, so I tried to come up with all these logos, but then that logo is too complicated to put on a lot of things. You know, if you want to embroider it yeah. or yeah. engrave yeah, it small. It. And so I would do all these different ones. The last logo I did I actually even called Magpul. I don't know if you were still at Magpul or not. 
because it was the front of our three prong flash hider. Right. And yeah. I wanted something simple. And I, I drew that and I was like, oh my God, it looks just like Magpul. And so then I sent it over to Magpul and asked yeah. whoever at the time it's it probably Rich. been Richard yeah, someone, had it and said, I think this looks a lot like yours. Does it look too much? Do you want me not to use it? And you guys said, no, fuck, yeah, it's fine. fine. If I would have realized people were going to abbreviate SLGW, like our emails for the longest time were Sons of Liberty GW. It's just so long. I don't like spelling it to people on the phone. And <laughs> yeah. Shit. yeah. We finally did that like two months ago. We changed all of them to at SLGW.com. If I would have realized at the time that people were going to abbreviate the shit, I would have made everything shorter at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would have done, so I would have done a few things different too. So we never anticipated being here. We never anticipated like having this kind of, you know, like brand recognition. And we certainly did not anticipate the direction that the country was going to go in terms of like, like, banking and how interconnected stuff was with the internet and yeah. with big banks and insurance. So I, I look back at the, the choice to put sons of Liberty gun works and I guarantee you the word gun in our name has, like, has hurt us. Stuff. Yeah. 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 Sure. I mean, the square PayPal and all of that. Right. So, yeah. I mean, there's a reason I don't have firearms or armament no. or gun in my name. Well, I mean, we're no. permanently banned from Ven Venmo, PayPal, all sorts of things. I mean, on our personal yeah. accounts, like, I, I can't personally open a Chase account, which not that I would, but I mean, I'm <laughs> quite up the fuck you, Chase. It's ridiculous. But, no, 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 no. <laughs> but the point is, though, like, if I would have known nine years ago that the word gun could, like, seriously affect your ability to transact, yeah, no, I, yeah. Th who would have thought that? Because I think we're already. Being in this industry, two thirds of stuff's out the window. Whether it's marketing companies that won't work with you, yeah. people that won't print your T-shirts, oh, yeah. banks, all the stuff. Salesforce. It, it is a strange. It is a strange deal that people get so passionate. I mean, I guess because it's a partisan issue, really. Well, I think it's this yeah. ESG shit, dude. You know, uh, we we talked about this last time, but I think that a lot of these companies that are, have gone, you know, like pretty far woke, and they have. I mean, like, you know, uh, I think that they. Ha I think yeah. that to protect their own whatever image they think that they should have it it, it comes with the side of you know rejection yeah. of all things not you know well the the, the dramatic overcorrection I, th I think it's going back the other way now i think it's hurting all those causes which it normally does mm -hmm. when, you, when you take it too far so I, i'm anxious to see hopefully we'll see in this next political cycle too that they Swing went too far the and it's yeah. yeah just the ridiculousness of <laughs> so much stuff now but it's always been because i i mean you think i started my first company before the crime bill in 94, right. uh, Clinton. <clears throat> no. You know, so I've been through lots of these cycles of yeah, things really over time. you've really been through the up and down, huh? Yeah. Wow. Um, Where were y'all based? Were y'all always based off of with Georgia, right? Or in Atlanta, yeah. Atlanta, yeah. Atlanta. And then um, once uh, after the Remington stuff and all, I went to New Hampshire, uh, the Live Free or Die state, which is strange that it's in New England surrounded by terrible states. But they have really good <clears throat> gun, good laws. gun laws. Yeah, yeah. really good. And uh, so I went there, SIG's there, and for years we were about a mile from SIG. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I am now. Winters are long, but yeah, New Hampshire's awesome. I live on the ocean. So what's it's winter? beautiful there. We don't, we don't have oh, those here. Yeah. <laughs> Once every 10 Four years. Four months of two yeah. feet of snow constantly. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not made for that. I will, I will not be spending winters full time there probably from now on. But and Nick, it, you're, you're in North Carolina. Yeah, just outside of Raleigh and Hillsborough. We located there for two reasons. Um, the biggest one is one of our most important customers down at Fort Bragg. Uh, so it makes it convenient. Those guys pop up. We cook some steaks, design product in real time, and send them home with the prototype type thing. That's a huge, um, huge deal. That, that geograph that, yeah, yeah. That's a huge geographic advantage for you sure. You don't realize it until you either have it or don't have it. Yeah. But the fact that I can literally drive an hour and talk to those guys, and I don't have to do the government loans for equipment. They just drive up to our office and put it on the table, and we design stuff. It's great. Yeah, I've been to your shop. His shop is badass. <laughs> I need to come visit. The way we're working on be. it. Yeah, you guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah you he's good at cooking steak too, and you made us one. And you were, you were <laughs> it was real. I, was, I thought it was really good. And you were, you were, you're a perfectionist, and you're like, no, I'm we're trying. Gonna that that trigger is it. cheating. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I, need, I need. I definitely want to come visit, man. And uh, I love. I love a lot of the stuff you guys are doing. Like I've been playing with a bunch of it lately. And Thank uh, you, yeah, yeah. No, it's, appreciate it. You, I, I can I can tell that uh, some real thought went into it, and I can tell there was some real end user feedback. <laughs> there is that. Uh, again, like not to kind of go back to the, the origins of how I met Kevin and whatnot, but I I kind of got springboarded into that community very very quickly in a way that most people don't like having yeah. access to him read knight john noveski all that kind of stuff it, it really shortened the, the learning curve for me just professionally speaking so I, I can't tell you again i didn't know at the time but in hindsight i got so lucky 
just yeah it was a good timing around. i think we were lucky too timing wise just that well i mean it's unfortunate but 9 11 and the war you know just that timing and there's so right. much money and effort spent into you know small arms for the military and you know it's probably not going to happen again the same way for another right. 50 years or something no so, yeah. I, I, yeah no i agree like that like there was an m4 on the news every night you know yeah. with, with the global war on terror and then of course you had this, yeah, yeah then you had the sunset of the assault weapons ban because right. the thing about how much innovation did not happen between 94 and 2004 yeah, yeah. I, I don't think a lot of the gun grabbers realized the disadvantage that they put our military and you know law enforcement in whenever the commercial market funds a lot of this r&d oh, the, yeah. the, the, oh the, that's where it makes sense yeah, yeah the, the commercial market helps drive some of this and then that then, then capitalism kicks in and then all of the better gun companies are competing for a performance Cool. edge yeah. and that's how some of this stuff really gets honed down and good by the time it yeah, ever is adopted we don't want someone. the chinese making our guns people <laughs> <laughs> but you know you say that I'm, I'm writing a silencer book right now with james ruffley and ian, ian mccullough and the chapter that i just wrote was my explanation of like maxim had been in the silencer in about 1908 and the technology that he developed then we still use now but in 34 and commercially the silencers were kind of dying off commercially by then anyway but 34 regulated silencers and so 200 dollar tax so stuff that they started trying to do in vietnam was a hundred years behind the maxim stuff you know and the reason was you know they just you know our government destroyed the market so there was no innovation and then we're, we're fighting, you know, in Vietnam, this guerrilla war. They forgot also, how to do it, yeah. And we, they said, hey, we want to reduce the sound and flash of guns. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, okay, well, Maxim was on to that, you know, at that point, what? 50 years 50 ago. years before. And all that time was lost. And we even started backwards from it. And so silencers didn't become really good. I mean, a, a sum for the government in the early 80s, but again, really until like the 90s. Yeah. And and it's it's because, yeah, there was no free market for it. So there was no competition. And I mean, everything, I mean, even 20 years ago, we still had like, you know, duct tape and mag lights to go. I mean, lights, optics, yeah. right. well, slings, well, that's everything. The thing. So, I mean, unless you've unless you've been down this path, a lot of folks don't know how that how it works. But, you know, even if you were approached by, you know, um, you know, a very like a, a very cool entity, right? It's it's a it's a it's a very small entity. Yeah. And so, you know, if someone's asking for something cool, um, you have to weigh that against your ability to like to monetize it through the commercial market. Because if you're going to go spend a million dollars in R and D to try to to try to accomplish something, you're not going to recoup it through like uh, like a small contract. You're going to recoup it through the you know, it, making it commercially av available. Yeah, yeah. 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 Clone guns. <laughs> well, no, no, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah. not even that. I mean, like, look, I mean, look at like, I mean, look at how like you know, like some of these RDS things happen, or like you know, forty-five degree, you know, RDS. Yeah. You know, you, you look at, I mean, or some some of these other developments. I should, that's probably not the good examples. A lot of that came from like the competition world. The point is, well, a lot of that's intertwined as well. Sure. Actually, I mean, we yeah. have that conversation all the time. Like, hey, we want to develop this thing for this very specific use. It's like, if anybody else can buy this, is it worth? Well, making, you know? yeah. yeah, but you know, you think there's some things to me that you can't chase. Like, there's no commercial use for it that they want. But then there's companies you think about Larue or Geisley. They only exist because these groups wanted a product. Their their armors or gunsmiths came up with a product, give it to them to produce and make, and they end up with this big right. commercial success mm -hmm. and a product line from those guys. And so it can work both ways. I mean, if it weren't, I don't know that there would be Geisley making guns or Larue making gun stuff if it weren't right for these things being brought to them. For sure, but I don't think that they could have kept the machines turning or the lights on without commercial dollars. Oh, one hundred percent is what I mean. It's the way I look at products now. You know, when when the Navy asked me to do three hundred blackout years ago, I was like, well, okay, uh, let me look at it. And within us shooting, within a couple of weeks, I said, this is going to be the most successful cartridge. The idea that okay, short barrels, it works great. Silencers are becoming popular. And you can have super and subsonic. And at the time, my children were young, and uh, I, I had a ranch and would spend a lot of time there. And so I have three kids that are all a year apart, but you know they're growing different. I could take one gun hunting an AR and with a collapsible stock and have it fit every one of the kids, no matter what. And so like that was a product where it's like, okay, we'll do 300 blackout. And I, you know, you always want the the street cred of 
a product being adopted by them. Then you also like want to give these guys a capability they don't have. So sure. that's like an awesome thing. But for me, once I realize something can be successful commercially, I will do everything for, for these guys. I don't care if we're talking about, you know, a hundred or a thousand or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's kind of like eight, six. Now the success with 300 blackout and realizing what's good and bad about it. And we start, we've been thinking about eight, six. We did it originally when we did 300 blackout it was the original prototype. We started with 338 federal and it's like, well, if we can get guns smaller and lighter, this will be much better. And then what we ended up with is something that's three X what 300 blackout is without a lot of sacrifice. When you talk about size and weights of the guns, but I'm like, I'll do, I want it for the military because it gives them a capability. I know they don't have being able to shoot stuff at 300 meters with a subsonic cartridge and, you know, shoot anything on the planet basically. And the dispersion, the accuracy, you know, doing the fast twist, but I know commercially how successful it's going to be. Yeah. So I'll do anything for the military no, for it. No, exactly. I mean, I think anybody that pursues some of that stuff, uh, number one, you're probably an actual patriot. Like, I mean, because you, cause you know that, that some of those projects can be very difficult in time, in taxing right. and time, right? right? <clears throat> so you're doing that because you really care right. and, and you, you really believe in the, in the, in the mission and the cause. Um, but it certainly does help to know that like the R and D on things could be financed <laughs> by, the, yeah. by the commercial market. Yeah. Because, because you, you, if you come up with something really badass, every American, American, every American is going to want one, you know, and that's, that, that yeah, well, that's too. I mean, that's what, it, yeah, you're exactly right. And that's a great feeling. And, and I still, and you can probably tell, like, I'm still as passionate about my work as I was 30 years ago. I still love it. I get up. I can't wait every day to get to work. I love what we're doing. I love developing product. But I'll see, you know, it's funny when we talk about like the internet, we're talking about some of that shit. And it's like, <laughs> oh, Kevin's such an asshole. He's probably going to charge $4 a round for this car. And it's like, everybody, you're so stupid. <laughs> I, I don't own an ammo company. Eight six has cost me millions of dollars, millions. And the best engineer in our industry, it's always done for three years. Guess what? I don't own a fucking ammo company. I don't get a royalty for you guys or anybody else building an eight six gun. So how does it benefit me? You know, it's yeah. brand equity, and we're developing capability, and I open source everything. So you guys don't have to do the R&D and spend the millions of dollars and take the chances. I'll give it to you because not only I want commercial customers to have it because for hunting or target shooting, it's more fun and it gives you a capability you didn't have. And so for the military too, but that is, it's interesting when you talk about, okay, so now I can build more guns in 8.6 and I can sell more silencers. So that's, that's a great thing, but really it's kind of brand equity and it's an exercise. I have a big engineering team. And it's just like the military. We got to keep, you know, their legs stretched. All right. Because if a 9 11 happens again, you want those fuckers to be ready and yeah. have the best equipment. And it's kind of like I view that with my engineers. You know, I've got a lot of engineers for a company my size. And if we're not doing cool shit constantly, they're going to go work other places. And so I have to invest in them. And this is like an example of that to where, you know, when I talk to my board of directors, they're like, for two years, they're like, um, Kevin, you're not an ammo company. <laughs> Why do you have the best engineer in the industry working on fucking ammo? Like yeah. you're a gun company. It needs to be designing guns. It's like, yeah, but you know, brand equity and we're going to give these guys a capability they don't have. and We'll be able to sell the gun. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's just an interesting part of the business. And if you don't think I'm passionate about it and want to develop the best stuff, it's like think in terms like if you guys right now spent millions of dollars to develop a cartridge, how the fuck does that benefit y'all? No, it, it doesn't. And as soon as it gets uh, Sammy approved, then you've lost all control over the chamber, right. the cartridge, everything. Right now, I know this because we are releasing our own cartridge. Oh, we're releasing, yeah. we're releasing the six Mac, the six Max, which is a uh, we're building it to. to I think it's going to. It's going to be pretty. When you compare it to the Arc, it's pretty damn cool, right? I mean, no more broken bolts, no more broken extractors. I mean, like you know, but in, in being able to eat the performance, the ballistic performance yeah. of the Arc, right? So it uses a standard bolt. Yeah, five, use five, the five, five, six bolt. That's dude. awesome. That's yeah. Man. What about magazine? So right now we have twenty round mags with thirty round mags in the works. But here's the cool thing about our thirty round mags: they don't have a big steep curve. They're straight and they fit in regular mag pouches. Oh, nice. um, so the arc has to be neutered around like 72,000 uh, PSI because the way that it's not really supported very well in the chamber for those ARs. And then, of course, you have to you have some geometry issues, with the bolt and the extractor like we're pushing this shit at 65,000. 
Yeah. You know, so so that for me, we're, we're looking at that. At that case, so I, you know, I think to myself, there's probably a very short window in which you control the chamber and you control the cartridge. And then once it's SAMI approved, which I guarantee you both of these things are going to probably happen relatively soon. At that point, you yeah. lose all control over the... Yeah. yeah, well, once you submit it. So yeah. you basically, they meet twice a year and you have to have a voting member of SAMI um, submit it. So like, we're not able to submit. We're not a voting member of SAMI. We're not able to submit. Um, but you'll get the right sponsor very soon. I have well, no doubt. <laughs> Horn Hornady's already done it and they submitted no. it at the June meeting and it'll be approved in January. So it'll be a awesome. SAMI approved That's awesome. Congratulations. Dude, that's a, congratulations. And, you know, you've contributed something awesome to the entire firearms world. But at that point, you no longer own that chamber. Yeah, that's right. But I think it's why we took our time with this one and we've kept it close because we wanted to make sure the twist was right. And there's just a lot of things that people, I think, if you've never, because you get ammo companies that develop cartridges where they don't build guns. And so I think about the delivery system because when you talk about Six Arc, I'm sure Six Arc's a great cartridge. But you're trying to put it in something it wasn't designed for. So you break bolts. It's not reliable because of the magazines. Not, you know, and you could say, oh, mine's reliable. Sure. Go build a thousand of them. Yeah, it yeah. ain't ever going to be as reliable as a 5.56. Five, yeah. And so when you start having to change the mag and the bolt, you know, I don't know. But I want the cartridge to be, you know, barrel swap only for me is great commercial market being able to use the same bolt but you got a new mag and it doesn't have to curve too much that yeah. is a secret for the ar so that's great um, yeah it's going to be hard to catch up with 556 five, mag reliability considering that we have like 70 years of collective yeah. data on no, it you, i mean you just can't and you're on the 27th yeah. iteration of a follower you know for geometry but but at the same time we we've i mean from what we're seeing it's been quite impressive and reliable and good you know so uh, we're also designing this more for have a precision roll although i think when people see the ballistics of it i think it almost renders the 556 five, obsolete you know i mean across the board it's like 42 percent more of everything and yeah, one of the great things you know. about it too is you can use the the range of bullet grain weights you can use is really wide you can go from yeah. 55 to what 103 with it and oh, i think the three we're bringing to market first is a 58 and 85 and a 90 i think uh, it's one, in the 103s yeah, yeah. when you start talking about six mil i mean 243 it's killed so many Deer in America. Low that was my first rifle. Yeah. That was my very first rifle. I just, before I just bought my eight-year-old one. <laughs> yeah. um, Do you guys, I don't know if you'll remember, but I know you will, the Knight's PDW. Oh, absolutely. So that was six a six by 35. Mil. I mean, that's actually six mil blackout. It's six mil by 35. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, the downside is there's no real subsonic. But right. that was a four and a half pound gun. It was freaking awesome. It's badass. But, yeah, I don't know. I love that thing, and I love the concept of that. So this is more... It's closer to that, what you guys are talking about. Yeah. So back to what we were talking about before, that's one of my frustrations with Knights. They don't do the commercial side the same way. Mm. So they developed this beautiful rifle, and then it just went nowhere. It just dies on the vine. Yeah. It died on the vine, yeah. So I, I would Hornady, love for them Hornady to do that. was loading the ammo. I remember, I I remember uh, uh, Mr. Knight was letting me shoot it down at his place, and I'm you know shooting full auto and stuff. And you know this guy is like the richest dude I know. He comes over to me, and he's like, how many of those mags are you going to shoot, Kevin? That's 80 cents a round. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And he was yeah. serious. He was dead serious. Yeah, exactly. But that's, yeah, why, that's why he's the richest man you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. That's why yeah. I need tank, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Back exactly. then, that was a lot of money for ammo. He's oh, like, yeah. Kevin, I have to buy a million rounds at a time, and it's eighty cents a round. What the fuck are you doing? I'm like, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> Got it. But well, uh, you, you had said something earlier. I wanted to touch on it. And you're like, it, like you read some of the criticism online about you know, the, the, how much a round's going to cost, or about something like that. And I, I, I share some of those frustrations. And I read the criticism about about my brand and about friends of mine about their. Kind of, I'll read some of this stuff, and I, and I sometimes I go just click on that person's profile, and I think I was like, for the last 14 years, every day. All day, the only thing I've done is this. This yeah. is it. This is all I've done for the last 14 years, from right. morning till night. And, you know, and I go look at their profile, and it's like, you work at Burger King. You know? Yeah. And I, and I mean, right. not, not, to, <laughs> and not to be a dick, but I'm yeah. just saying, like, you know, perhaps you should really understand the intention of the platform or the actual performance of what we're going for or what it maybe took to achieve some of this stuff or, or you know, or like or replicating it thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times in a row, whether it's weapon systems or anything else. And I wonder, I think that's lost on a lot of like uh, the end users sometimes that, you know, and from whatever anecdotal experience, 
maybe I'm not doing a good job of like explaining our product or what I or what we're or what went into it or why. It's difficult yeah. for a lot of people to understand. But I, I, I ponder this stuff a lot because I still think I'm such a student of it, and I don't know shit. No, of course. And the reality yeah. is, I learn stuff every single day. That's my point. I don't and, know and, it all. You know, and the reality is, uh, you know, like I have an online persona and stuff, but I intentionally, there's never a meeting at my company where I'm the smartest person in the meeting. And I have brilliant engineers and designers, and I participate with them, and I learn shit every day. But when you start thinking about you're talking about 14 years. So I've got 30 years. So in America... 10,000 hours, you're considered an expert. In Japan, 40,000 hours. I have 100,000 hours doing my job. And I should be way smarter and better at it than I am. But it's like, if you if you got into guns, you're 22, you got into guns three years ago, and you've read a bunch of shit online, like, that's fucking cool. And I love young people being in our industry. But, like, sit down and shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> you know, like I, I've, I've spent more money on, you know, what? machining chips than, than <laughs> you've ever made like i don't without that experience you don't know shit i mean if i could take everything that reed knight's learned oh gosh and yeah. have that and, you know and reed knight's a brilliant guy he's also not the smartest guy i know but i don't know anyone with more experience doing something similar to what you you guys and what we do than reed knight i would pay anything to have so his knowledge and experience that experience uh the first time i ever went down and i saw i was with the founder of magpul richard fitzpatrick and then his business partner mike mayberry yeah we got a tour from reed and so i was what 22 years he, old he's forgotten like more than all of us know put together so this guy we're going through the museum and he's talking about gene his buddy gene gene and yeah, it no, took me an v hour <laughs> fucking eugene yeah. stoner it, it clicked i'm like oh yeah and yeah. then he'll talk about uh you know chuck and like the founder of delta force I'm like yeah. oh so Norris stuff. But you know, he he's got all this this history that just yeah, it doesn't he was live there anywhere in his fucking six star yeah. and, and when well, well, that was start. a story of like Reed Knight, yeah. right? He would he would like pull up to like the like the, the gate over in Virginia, like in this like van van full of guns, and just like that was I think that's how he started, you know. Yeah. I've heard so many stories from him over the years. It is interesting, like because I well I don't know. Because I know I, I read criticisms of me or my company online. No, what, what, what are what are yours? What do people criticize you guys about? Well, so there's a they're like, oh, Sons of Liberty doesn't make anything. They uh, they 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 you know rebrand stuff and slap our logo on. And I'm like, like, well, then why the fuck do we have engineers on the paper? Why do we have like? Technical yeah. drawings. Why? Why do we? You know, why do we have our own intellectual property? Why are we spending money on this stuff? You know, or, you know, why are there like, so, you know, just because something's not machined under your house, just because you know that there's a machine house that that uh, machines something for you, but to your print, to your intellectual property, to your exact specifications out of materials, whatever else, with our ability to reject that and it's machined yeah. for an ins a very specific well, purpose, I would have I would have to say like, okay, well, what define make? Well, yeah. I, I would know? I would say to that it's it's like when we were talking about experience you, you know if i have a hundred thousand hours reed knight probably has a quarter of a million hours doing stuff and if i want to be really great at what i do but i'm never going to be you know we machine stuff in house and all but we're never going to be as good as you know if i have if i get a swiss machine and we're making parts on a swiss i'm never going to be as good as shops that specialize in yeah. that that's that's one thing we can do yeah we can use shops. that's a good point that, like, that, but yeah. that was but that was our entire reasoning for wanting to do that like instead of going completely vertical and then doing everything kind of mediocre i think it has I, to be a combination he's the, he's yeah. the best shop for that you know we use the yeah. best yeah. Well, shop the best right. guy, yeah and then also the ability to flex up or down cuz i mean if you look at like you look at how many companies that that fold after like a rush or something yeah. like that they've gotten so well. leveraged in some of this stuff to where i mean i think we have slightly unique because we we have a lot of really good support we i think we've all managed our businesses really well but i see some companies that got super leveraged into that stuff trying to do that and then as soon as the, the machine stops turning well fuck yeah right? i mean well daniel defense has been a great example of that over the years but you think sig is a great gun company when in the two years i was there they laid off 900 people so it, you know, I've never laid anyone off. If you lose your job at my company, you get fired because you're not doing a good job. Yep. Like, th that's it. But, you know, I also don't want to work at a place where, okay, uh, we've got all these military contracts this week or whatever. Our gun sales are hot because whatever political thing is going on. But, hey, yeah, so we're going to lay off 400 people this morning? Like, what a shit place to work. 
Like, yeah. I, I would be terrified. I don't like. I don't ever want to be the biggest company. I don't ever want to be in that position. I think it's what you're saying. Like I. Yeah. Well, so but, but I, I've enjoyed going and, and working with true specialists. If you go work with like a Swiss machine company and that's all they do, that yeah. is all they do from morning till night. I don't You're think they're going to be as good. I, well, I cannot compete with that guy. So why? Why not just, you know, like, yeah. like form a good relationship, <clears throat> explain the expectations back and forth and then and then do that. Like that's me is not a bad way. I'll t that is not a bad way to get things get things done. You yeah. know, if, you know? If I could do it. If I. I never wanted to own a machine shop. And now it's like, I want to have a machine shop more than I want anything else. Um, so I see both sides. And and for us, well, if we do AR based stuff, there's so many companies that, that make those components. You can find companies that can machine that stuff better than you can. But you know, with our, the fix, our bolt action, there's just special stuff in it, you, you know, that no one else yeah. makes. And so over time, it's been a hindrance for us. So, you know, that's where we started bringing stuff in house, all those critical parts for that platform. And now, like you, you're looking at uh, our guns today, like the boom box or the honey badger. And I love people say to us, oh, Kevin, fuck that guy, $3,000 for a honey badger. You can build one just as good for $1,000. Well, <laughs> okay. Go you know, it's, it. it's pins and springs are like the only common parts. It just looks like an AR. When I showed you the boom box today, it's like there's nothing common in that gun. You know, so like I was joking, I was joking with Kevin whenever he showed me this, and uh, I, I felt like we were, I felt like I was meeting in like a, an alien or like a like an uncontacted tribe or something because, you know, <laughs> our approach for how we incrementally improve things and we want to like you know focus on fundamentals but beef things up materially, and then you look at that thing and you realize that they they started from a completely different trajectory as we're trying to do you know incrementally make this and this and this and this better they kind of just said let's just let's just do something completely novel yeah. you know uh and I, and I respect that and, and for someone who's been into guns as long as i have and, and has that kind of mind instantly when i look at it i can see okay this was a pretty good idea yeah you know that's oh, a beautiful well, thank gun. you i mean but you know we started when we did the honey badger years ago we just cut up an AR, you know, it's a Nevesky lower. cut low. up an MP7 too. Yeah, and an MP7 and made it. <laughs> and uh, it's a Nevesky yeah. lower and you got some Knight's Armament parts on and just like whatever. We started with that. But as it went on, that gun evolves like you're talking about. Before you know it, you've touched every part on the gun. So there's a reason the Honey Badger is over a pound lighter than everything else in size. Because every part on the gun is different. There's nothing off the shelf. So I'm not able to save any money doing that. But, I mean, that's the way you guys are going. And you'll, you'll see you'll get to a point where you're like, shit, we've changed everything on here. And we want to do this next thing. Let's just start the way we should with the new gun from the ground up. Well, I think there's something to that. And I also think that, like, one of the things I've thought of in this, like, from, from day one of the company, I've always at least, like, thought in the back of my mind about the idea of civil unrest or about the idea of like one day the trucks will stop running or one day, you know, the electricity or power is off. Right. And so one of the approaches that we had to our guns is that, you know, like, 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 can you, can you butcher that rifle for extractor springs and, you know, yeah. you know, or like, so, you know, in like some of the parts commonality simply for the fact that like, you know, the, the interchangeability of things dimensionally, for how I looked at things, made, yeah. made that was part of the impetus. A matter of fact, like the earlier rails and stuff that we used, I wanted to use like a one and a quarter crow foot to be able to service that as opposed to some proprietary tool. Now, with that being said, I think that whenever you do something a bit more, not you can probably squeeze out a little bit more specialized performance in something like yeah. that whereas we were looking at it as when the fucking aliens land or whenever the like that's yeah. when the chinese <laughs> drop a bomb on us yeah you know i mean like you know what are we gonna do so, yeah. i mean but, I, but what i love is that these are the kind of con these are the kinds of conversations where your brand and my brand are being discussed somewhere on reddit by people that have never met us have never held either of our products yeah that, that you know that, that regurgitate stuff they've read somewhere else but if they ever sat down and actually asked, well, why did y'all choose this thing? You and I could talk for an hour on why we chose this thing that you didn't even yeah. notice was on the fucking gun. But, um, you, you yeah. know, so that, I have got a point on that. So you guys made a post the other day about a new uh, barrel that you're releasing that has five eighths threads on it. Yes. And I, I made a comment. I'm like, why? And there was a very detailed explanation as to what that is. That content is very valuable. 
You well, should but, but see, that. I, took, I, t- I kind of took for granted. I kind of <laughs> thought that people would just intuitively know why. And I realized that's not true. And, and, mm-hmm. and, 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 that, and that's not their fault. That's my fault for not getting out there and explaining it and saying, hey, well, we did it for these reasons. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I want people to argue with me. I want people to disagree yeah. with me. But I at least want them to know why we did that. Like, right. You yeah. say, hey, right. well, you're going to disagree. No, you disagree, yeah. but you it's should at least know why we thought yeah. we So totally. I need to be a better ambassador of our brand. You well, know? It, it isn't. Well, I don't know. I, I, what you said was interesting to me, and I, I think it comes down to we're doing the same thing. But you start with the requirement. What are we trying to do? And like what you talked about to me makes sense and is interesting. Well, we can do everything specialized, which is sort of what I'm doing right now. But an, an instance could be, what if you need tools for it? Well, okay, so it's a compromise. Mine's a compromise because you're probably going to have to have specialized tools. Yep. Yours is a compromise because you could probably get a little more performance, but you can work on your gun without having specialized tools. And, that, and that's valid. You know, so it looks like well, it's sort of what's the approach and what are you trying to achieve and really understanding what you're trying to achieve first before you start working on it. And if you're smart, there's always a reason, you know, because we get to a crossroad all the time where it's like, OK, we could do 5H24 or we could do this. And they're both pretty good. You just got to pick one at some point, too. And it, it might make more sense for this thing for 5A's yeah. and hundred percent. And then the also a lot of end users are like, I guess some of your more casual end users might not realize where some of these things came from or if there was a requirement we were legitimately trying to fulfill or if someone specifically requested something. Right. right? And so if you're looking at a a widget and you're like, you know, I, I, I like my widgets. Uh, phosphated man because that's like you know that's the best in the world well what if somebody requested a qpq widget because i, I don't know corrosion resistance right. because you know <clears throat> these people are working you know in florida and they you know and they and it yeah. needs to be highly cr- like i mean you, you might not realize like the thing exists because it because it has to for yeah. a very specific set of circumstances yeah, right. and instead of just dismissing it outright you right. know perhaps you should select things that are best for your yeah. Set of circumstances. Well, just like when Nick, you know, you were talking about on, on the internet, you were about the five H threads, and you, you, yeah, you yeah, weren't yeah. like y'all are retarded. You, were, you, why did you do this? Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. got an explanation. That's what but more people need you to do. Gave me the explanation. Like Mike needs to publish this, but that messaging, that that communication. It's awesome. I mean, I look at a lot of the work you do. It's clearly specialized. Like, I mean, do you guys go out there and explain the why of why this angle is here, or why we <clears> move <throat> the nut here, or you know, th- this is always kind of a weird conversation because the the customers we deal with, they're they're hard to access, right? You can't just call up someone from the yellow pages and be like, hi, I'd like to talk to you know Ninja Team 6, whatever. So uh, it, the communication, like the process that this happens, it's very informal oftentimes. And like Kevin is kind of the master of this stuff. He helps generate the requirements. So it's not necessarily like through to block out. I don't think they came to you and said, this is exactly what I want, make it. No. You guys did the development on it. Well, yeah, originally what they wanted was 762 by 39 right. in their ARs. And we tried to tell them it wasn't going to work. And then it didn't work, and so then they right. found Whisper. No, how much did Ron Silvers have to do with that? Rob? Rob yeah, Rob. Rob had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I actually teach some of the those stuff in his class, in my class, because, I mean, he, he he had a lot to do with the development of the cartridge, right? Yeah. Or, so or, 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 or I guess explain, I, these, are, these are the questions I wanted to ask you. Rob, Rob was in charge. He was yeah. in charge of that program for us. So, um, but 300 Blackout, the big difference in it and Whisper. It's a good, it's a great. Yeah, because we, yeah. we could go, like I could go really in the weeds, but it's not going to matter. Okay. The, 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 here's why 300 Whisper would never be successful. Because J.D. Jones, brilliant guy, but he's using 308 bullets. You have to design a bullet for 300 Blackout. It has to have the right O-Jive. And you need a length, overall cartridge length, to take up the full magazine to get reliability. So what we really did, it was two things, but the only thing that really matters anybody listening to this would be the the correct bullets so it would feed reliably and work reliably that's the, that's really what we did and rob was in he was in charge of that and uh you, you know and it's interesting I, mean, I could go in the rabbit hole for days on this because once rob did this johnny nebesky sent me uh, a barrel i think or an upper and rob was loading ammo in his basement and we started forming bullets and stuff to be more correct. Um, so Remington had purchased their company at the time, and the only military contract they had for ammo was shotgun ammo. Remington oh. rifle ammo was complete dog shit. And so if 
I asked them to make load ammo for us, and they told me to fuck off. And they said they, they were so against it because the ammo company wasn't involved, and it was a customer they didn't have and a customer that wasn't going to work with them directly. And they wanted to work with us because we were building all the silencers for that team at the time and everything. And we had a good relationship with them. And um, so uh, we're, we're loading the ammo in the basement. And so the guy was such an asshole that was in charge of the ammo company. He says, when you get a military contract, we'll load your ammo. <laughs> and I said, well, how the fuck do I get a military contract if you don't load me any ammo to get a military contract? Yeah. He's like, it's never going to go anywhere. Every young asshole this company thinks they're going to do the next great cartridge. But... And he like embarrasses me in front of a room full of executives there at the thing. And me and Rob, basically, but Rob is such a little dork. He didn't say anything. He just sat there and shut up. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck you, man. And so what we did was Rob loaded enough ammo for us. And we sent it to SOCOM that I got a million round order, a military contract for a million rounds of ammo. So Remington, they were so thankful and so glad. General counsel came to my office with security and suspended me immediately for and investigated me for potentially bribing a military official wow. because it's the only way you could get a military contract without ammo. And, yeah. and so that is uh, fuck you gr freedom group. Yeah, and uh, no, I think I think to push back on that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and that's it, it, and to those guys' credit, the first batch of ammo they got commercial run, they sent me the crate. So, like in my podcast room, I have the crate of the first oh, delivery cool. of that's military cool. ammo, and you know, like that was such, like, what a bunch of fucking losers, of freedom group. I mean, so, just ugh, I've, got, I've got my like favorite that. blackout story that I told on the the podcast we did with Kevin at Q. Uh, the first guns that went overseas, the first three hundred blackout uppers, were Noveski guns that Johnny hand built. So technically, the first one were AAC that, that Kevin sent over, but these guys had the ammunition; they didn't have the uppers yet, and so they got permission to purchase the privately owned uppers and John Noveski hand built them and sent them for free like 10 days later to me. Yeah. Johnny was a patriot. Man. He was, uh, the, yeah, he was all American uh, badass. That is for yeah. sure. I remember calling Noveski like the shop and, and John answering the phone. And, uh, I, and, and so this was like right after uh, team America world police came out <laughs> and, uh, and my, my bro and a bunch of the guys were deployed there in the seal teams, they were deployed. And, uh, as a joke, man, I, I got all the dust covers, a surprise cock fag dust covers. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, and John was like, Hey, we stopped making those a long time ago. We don't have any more. I was like, I was like, dude, uh, you know, this first some guys overseas, man, I want to send him as a like, part of the care package, you know? Yeah. And I, I think he probably fired up the laser dude and just made him. Sure. You know, yeah, he and, totally and he, he, he sent that. him to me. And I'm really grateful I got a chance to talk to that dude uh, before because, you know, that was, he was very much ahead of his time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 He, he was. all the sense of humor, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was odd as fuck. He was. He was but, funny. But people don't understand the contribution I think he made. He was the first person to really do premium AR-15s. Yes. Yeah. Back in the day, it was like Olympic Arms, DPMS, Bushmaster, well, just garbage. I think, I think yeah. what it was was though is that is like as far as like a recce type of role that you can have a truly accurized and reliable right. AR that could that could supplement a bolt gun yeah. and a precision application. And and he you know the pack nor all that relationship. Yeah, I mean, his barrels really changed a lot. That and, and then you know like while I disagree now. With, but granted, I have a lot of years of hindsight to like reflect on, but like the I, the concept of the switch block made a lot of sense. He identified a real problem. Right. Whatever introducing suppressors to a gun, carrier speed, yeah, and like he, in my opinion, made one of the best adjustable gas blocks ever because it had two positions. Boom, right boom, you know, and it wasn't on off. Yeah. pretty I, smart. You I'll know? tell you a story about that. It was pretty interesting. So we're out there. He, he's showing us and um, said, "Okay, how did you pick?" the size for each port. And he said, well, you know, I shot it with, and it was whatever ammo at the time, you know, probably green tip or something. I shot it and I just measured the ejection like where it was. And then he got the silencer, which I don't know at the time, it might've been M4 2000, it might've been a night silencer or something, like a common silencer yeah. that the military would use. And he adjusted the port till it ejected to the same, plot, uh, same space on the That's ground. Smart. And it's like for a simple oh, way to yeah. do it and him not having like a bunch of engineers and stuff, but Johnny was a brilliant guy. Yeah. It was like the given the resources that he had, it was the fucking most brilliant way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just simple. You know, he just thought it out and said, okay, that's what it should be. And that's what you should do. And that's how he did it. You know, it's funny. It. he never would have told anyone had I not asked him that. But, right. Yeah. Oh, I love it, man. I mean, and that, 
like looking at that carrier speed, it, it's telling you what it's doing. You know, because yeah, he didn't have a high speed video, you know, a no, camera or anything. So he's simply crates and stuff. Yeah, yeah, no. But if you understand carrier speed, you know, that, yeah. that's sometimes simple is the best way. Yeah. I mean, it, well, it works. I mean, it, it works, dude. That's amazing, man. Yeah. So, but, but back to the history, though, that's what is kind of trying to drive home is the people that are probably watching this podcast right now, they never met John. They don't know why he's relevant. Oh, just look on the internet. Everybody was his best friend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so people ask me, like, why is an Obesky gun three thousand dollars? Why? What did he do? Like, it's hand built. I know it is. Yeah. But the, the entire history of this thing is yeah. like it, it created this entire AR premium. Like you guys benefit from it, too, yeah. right? No, that, I, that I look at John as like a pioneer. Yeah, I never yeah, really talked about that way, but he yeah. probably was the first sort of like hand built, but prolific premium AR and did a yeah. lot of smart things with it. Mm -hmm. And it also had a sense of humor, which we were talking about, like how sterile a lot of stuff is. The cool thing about Novesky is I remember during the, right around the Sandy Hook time, like shortly before he passed, you know, um, the, whenever like the whole band conversation was getting really heated up and all yeah. that kind of stuff, he had made an assault hammer. Remember that? It was like an armorer's hammer. It was an assault hammer yeah, that he was yeah. selling. Like, I mean, you know, the, 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 the dust covers. Oh, I mean, he did have tornadoes. But having, yeah. the, having humor, you know, in a, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a industry that is a little too, too rigid, too fucking rigid. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's cool. And, and you know what? You can get away with that whenever your product speaks for itself. Whenever your product fucks, yeah. dude, you can get away with having a yeah. little fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? Got to back it up. Yeah. 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 And rightfully so. Hmm. Yeah. There it is. The assault hammer. Oh, I oh, maybe fine. remember this picture. We, we, need, we, need find, we need to find one for a glass case at the shop. You, you know what? Oh, was funny. funny. Yeah. Most people don't know. Um, you know, like he built bolt guns originally and then started really? building ARs. Yeah, like his, well, he was I working have, at Pacnor, right? He worked for the yeah, barrel. So after company. the army, he worked at Pacnor and learned how to uh, to rifle barrels. And then I, I and I think it was probably the owner. Or it was someone there. I, this part I don't recall correctly, so I'm probably wrong. But someone taught him. And, and Johnny was I don't know if he was autistic, but he he was different. But um. They taught him and they wrote down like the steps to chamber a barrel correctly. And so that's what even years later, his shop, yeah. Chamber Dave, has that taped on his toolbox. And it, Johnny would just meticulous and he would do the steps directly every time the same way. And, you know, and, and learn to really chamber barrels and build precision guns, you know, and someone taught him. And, you know, when he understood why and then he could also shoot. So he knew if a gun shot, but um, yeah, so their barrels w were great because somebody took a lot of care and consideration and, and you know, chambers them correctly. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the chamber's a little different too, if I remember right. He, yeah. He, he's like the first kind of 22, 223 wild, like he had kind of made his own chamber. That's my yeah. understanding too, yeah. yeah. And then rifling too, he started doing different stuff with that. He was a smart guy. So on the 300 blackout, yeah. dude, so the way, way I've taught it here in the shop to our guys, I mean, you know, we use the A5 system on almost everything we do except 300 blackout. Yeah. And the reason why we don't do the A5 system on 300 blackout here is because I remember reading as the thing was being developed, and it was developed around an H2 buffer pistol gas system and like a nine inch barrel. Yeah. And I remember always like joking with the guys that were arguing with me about this. And I'm like, you want to go argue with the fucker that designed it? Because this is how the cartridge was kind of designed. You know, well, like, what yeah. barrel length was it designed for? That's some, that, like, we, we've always done nines. Nine, nine inch. inch. Yeah. 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 And, and you know why? Because you have full propellant burn at nine, right? You have super Zan subs. Is that no. the reason? What is the reason? No. So the, the guy that actually named the SDN6, who, who is a friend of mine, Nick's, who I won't call out. <laughs> um, but it, he's, he's, yeah. a, he's an awesome dude. He uh, So... And I don't even remember the exact thing, but there was some sort, probably in mobility, so probably in a helicopter or something, there was some sort of rack or some place they put guns that they already had the SDN-6 silencer. And so they wanted that on the 300 Blackout, an, a certain overall length, because where the guns they were replacing, there was already like racks and things made for those where they would fit in an aircraft and stuff. That's how the barrel and, length was and so That's how he picked the barrel length. He picked it. Nine wow. inches, and so then we developed everything around nine inches because of that. So I remember that's reading awesome. that, studying that, and yeah. that's why, like you know, we kind of we kind of used some of the data because we knew that it worked. We knew that formula worked, yeah. and then and you could play with it from and, there. And, and why reinvent it? I mean, because yeah. we did. We spent a lot of time and money. We had a lot of smart guys working on, it. and then the military tested a lot too. Because originally we de we delivered uppers to those organizations for their 
and they probably had four 16s, I think, at the time. And then, you know, later delivered complete rifles and stuff to them. But, you know, they were driving it, not us. And so the Barnes 110 300 Blackout is probably, that, that is one of the best rounds probably ever developed, in my opinion. Meaning it was for the nine inch barrel and we're squeezing every bit because Barnes was purchased by Remington stuff. by then. So we had control over it and every bit of performance out of that, out of this system. And that round is phenomenal. Like yeah, I that round, so that round stuff sucks. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, there are all these little things. Because, I mean, I've been in gun stores before and, uh, like, asked to see a 300 blackout that's on the wall or something. And the guy behind the counter explained to me why I don't want 300 blackout because it was developed for this or why I do want it and it was developed yeah. for this. And it's like, I hear so much bullshit all the time. And I'm, if anybody would ask me, like, I don't have a lot of secrets in general. I don't give a shit. So it's like you're asking the questions, and like, I'll, I'll t is, I'm getting so old now, I don't remember some of the things. But that's how like that happened. He, he picked the barreling. Dude, I love, I love going to gun shops and people try to explain things to yeah, me. And I'm like, I literally know that guy. Like, yeah. what, what the fuck are you talking about? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, where did you hear that? I heard a funny story. And uh, you, you're the you're the one that actually, I think you were there whenever he was selling it, uh, but like how the carbine gas system came to be, why a carbine gas system is the link that it is. And it's because uh, that's where the FSB had to be in relation to the muzzle so the fucking bayonet could fit. Yep. So if there wasn't like this yeah, weird engine, well, yeah. there wasn't this weird engineering, you know, uh, how like gas volume and, and length and, and, and dwell or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. What, they, what, they, what they they did was like that's that's where the FSB had to be in relation to the muzzle so that the bayonet could fit on an M4. Yeah, and then you know, of yeah. course, now once you know where the port is, then you understand dwell, open the port for volume, you make the tube to. Yeah. fit into that part of the key and you work it backwards but like yeah that's the it was because of the bayonet yeah, yeah. All those super <laughs> well, it, it, doesn't, it, right? it doesn't surprise me but think of all the things that you, you have to go through for reli for reliability and all um, and it's because how many different like two two three five five six rounds are out there on the market a lot and every hundreds, asshole yeah. that buys a gun thinks that it should work with that well right. the great thing about those military programs it wouldn't have been hard you could put the well, you're talking about the carbon gas system. You could have put the port just about anywhere within a certain range because you're dealing with one ammo. You know? So, like, to make a gun run with one ammo, great. Yeah, I get it all the time. People be like, oh, my honey badger, you know, it's not holding the last round up. It's like, well, you have an adjustable gas block. Adjust the fucking gas block. Well, I want it, you know, $3,000 gun should run. With, okay, what are you shooting? S and B. Oh, yeah. Uh, the no. cheapest shit ammo in the world. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, Monarch. I'm not. My, my man, my man, I, I agree. It should run with that. That, that, and that, that is that is frustrating. Like especially again, because there's no free lunch. And anytime you gain something over here, you give up something over here. Like if you yeah. want like that real yeah. nice soft shooting gun, and you know it has like that shootability, a high level of shootability. Well, okay, you know what? It'll probably require a little bit more maintenance than like the one that beats itself to death, right? Yeah. You know, or you know what? You, you it might be a little bit more selective or picky and, on or or picky a, on ammo yeah. because you know you have reduced dwell and the other. Like the thing is, I mean, you you try to explain that it's frustrating because I don't know how much. I wish they would put as much thought into it as you know we did to to build it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you, you think even with yeah. the A five system, okay, well, it's more expensive. It's less common, but it makes the gun longer and heavier. Smoother. But, yeah, but it makes it smooth. You know, like there's benefits, but there is a cost to it. So it's like, well, you know, what is it that you want? Yeah. You know. Because, um, yeah, because, I mean, and I appreciate this smooth shooting guns. I mean, anyone that I can't tell you how excited I was back in the 90s to get the G36. And when I got it, and then I was used to shooting M4s, and I shoot the G36. I'm like, oh, this thing sucks. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's yeah. like I'm not used to five, five, six having any recoil. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you, you know, you want to fold your stock? Okay. Well, there's going to be a cost to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we use the A5. Like, I think reduced recoil is like a byproduct. The actual reason is operational envelope. But it, you, the only way you'll ever yeah, get you that, want all the travel you can get. Yeah, exactly. And, right. and the the only the, I think the only time that people really get the full benefit of it is if they're going from suppressed to unsuppressed, suppressed to unsuppressed. You know, yeah. whatever. If you were to build a dedicated suppressed gun, I would build that gun a little bit different. Sure. You know? Like I mean, yeah. But 
Or, like, try, try doing that and then sending it out to RSR and then let them send it out to the whole right. world and then like get half from back because people are like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, the, like, that. like the guys that commit, like, you know, trying to shoot, like, my gun won't shoot shitty, you know, subsonic 300 blackout without a can on it. I'm like, but why are you doing that? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I won't even answer that question anymore, but people say, well, it doesn't function with subsonic without a silencer. Well, that's stupid. Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I don't. Uh, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Well, you know, and I think too, when people, you get in the A5 system, it's like, how far do you go? Because like, okay, well, just put a fucking A2 stock on it. You got a rifle. Yeah. No. Oh, no. You want a collapsible stock and you want all that. We had a police department come to us and they're, they're doing that. They're shooting subsonic, unsuppressed, throwing a blackout. We're like, why are Why? you doing that? Well, they're like, yeah, can, can, can you open the port for us? I'm like, no, I would rather, I'll just return your money. Like, yeah. because, like, because, because I'll tell you what, if that gun cycles subs unsuppressed, imagine what it's going to do suppress super. Yeah. Imagine how, how just violently shitty it's, just the thing's yeah, shoot. it's such a broad thing to accomplish already. A non-adjustable gas block, which is what our guns had originally yeah. for that. But we could do it because we controlled the ammo. The military was buying, they had a target round for super and sub, and then they had barrier blind stuff for super and sub. But we controlled the ammo. So we didn't have to have an adjustable gas block. And, but to cycle basically really heavy nine millimeter all the way to like an AK-47 round, which is what we're doing out of a short barrel. And we're able to get away with that with one gas system, a non-adjustable gas block, like, it's so hard. That's a or eight six is actually much easier. Really? You know? yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. So I can't it, wait to put some to rounds on that thing, dude. Yeah. I'm excited for that. Yeah. That's a good. It's, it's a super cool concept. Now you've shot that thing. You've shot subs out to a thousand, haven't you? Yeah, a thousand yards with subs That's out of a awesome. twelve inch barrel. Yeah. Well, I guess that super fast twist rate. I mean, it's it's getting a lot of stability. Was it one in five the twist rate? One in three. Oh wow! And is is it is it still responsive to dope out there? Like, if you were to put an input, is does it still? Yeah. Well, so it, it's it's interesting. So the government's doing um, like all the um, what do you like Doppler radar and stuff on it yeah, now. Yeah. So there's things like Brian Witt's brilliant. I, I love this. Yeah, yeah, he's a very smart guy. But but like his, his app won't work with it. So he's involved too, because fast twists. Okay, so you get spin drift faster, but you get spin drift with everything. Most people just don't shoot far enough to know. No. Um, so with the supersonic, you'll get start to get spin drift. You have to account for between three and four hundred meters with supersonic, really hot rounds. Um, but it's predictable, um, and you'll you'll get it with sub. But I don't really have to account for that till like four hundred yards. So by then, I'm not shooting animals anyway, so it doesn't matter. No. Um, well, what were you asking me? Forgot. Oh, but, uh, I was asking if it's responsive to dope out there. Like, if oh you were... yeah, well it shoots flatter. So fast twist actually shoots flatter, so you don't get as much drop. So you get better penetration. You don't get as much drop, and there will be spin drift, but it's predictable at range. And with subsonic, the spin drift, if I recall correctly, at a thousand was only one mil. So it's it wasn't that. No, much that's really as being said, it's predictable. Yeah. yeah. So so there will be reticles and all eventually for it, um, but it, it is interesting. It's been an exciting thing because. You know, if we controlled 300 blackout longer, it would be probably a one in three twist. It would be faster twist. But we didn't control it long enough. And then the barrier blind subsonic bullets, once we went to one in four, they would expand out of the muzzle. So we had to stop at one in five. But at one in three or one in two and a half, your dispersion, your accuracy, you get it gets better. It improves. And what kind of expansion do you see on subs with that bullet? With which one? With like, which, what's a good bullet that is going to give you good expansion on? An eight six. Yeah, for the eight six. Yeah. Well, I'll show you a picture. Um, so Hornady makes a good one, and it the expansion is it the bullet works well, but it's sub X, but the um, it doesn't look impressive. But it's Gorilla sent bullet. me one yesterday. Yeah. I'll show you. Um, now, are these bonded? So solid coppers and bonded bullets, but for subsonic, you don't. It doesn't have to be bonded. The Hornady Sub X is not a bonded bullet, and okay. it still stays together. Okay. So this is uh, this is pretty crazy, but oh yeah, it'll. Damn. Oh wow! So that's a three hundred and sixty grain bullet. So you guys can't copper. see this, but that's, we'll, a, that's we'll, a long bullet. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have a. Uh, well, I don't know that I can because I don't know they want to show anyone. Yeah, okay. well, okay. well, I'll drop it's it really to cool. You. We promise. <laughs> just, well, no, no, <laughs> I just I want to describe what we're looking at. It it, it, it looks like uh, looks like a grappling. Here, I'll, air, I'll air drop it and I'll ask them. Just don't don't put it in and and if I if I find that's out impressive, dude. 
Let's yeah. uh, um, are you? Oh shoot! I gotta do it to everyone here. No, oh, shit. Hey, don't worry about it, man. I got it. I think I got it. I'm old. Give me a minute. Yeah. Oh, no, that's Kyle's iPhone. Okay, you'll have it. Got it. So you got Hornady to, to sponsor for uh, Sammy. Well, yeah, sort of. So At the request of somebody, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were, and I don't know how much of it is not invented here syndrome. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so th there were some important customers that went to them and asked them to do it, and they obliged. But Horny was making a brass for us already and bullets and things like that. But it is, you know, and I don't know, because I think it, it will be interesting. I, I think this is what we'll see in five years from now, that in the last 30 years or so, there will be three cartridges, new cartridges that were a big success commercially. And at 300 Blackout, 6.5 Creedmoor, and 8.6 Blackout. And we will have done two of them, and we're not an ammo company. That's amazing. So, um, I mean, I don't think you can deal. argue 300 Blackout at this point, and definitely 6.5 Creedmoor is incredible and been successful. Um, but 8.6 is just really next level. And figuring out the fast twist, because this is what we're chasing, you know, we're getting this incredible performance. And that was a byproduct and kind of an accident. Because what was happening was the customer started using subsonic more and more. They wanted the best dispersion or the tightest groups they could get. So you got to spin that long, slow bullet fast. So we started getting good dispersion. And then when with barrier blind bullets, we started shooting gel. And then we started noticing the faster we spin the bullet, the more performance in the gel we're getting. And so that's what led us down this road. That's when I started shooting a lot of animals and stuff. Wow. And uh, so. Did you ever think of fucking with gain twist or progressive twist at all? Yeah, think about it. it just all the problems that people think you're going to have with super fast twists, like, oh, the bullet's going to come apart. Well, I've never had with 8.6 a bonded or solid come apart with one and three. Never, not once. Um, but they think, oh, well, you're going to have this pressure spike. Like, it's all theory. People no, run their exactly fucking right. mouths, and it's theory. You never, yeah, never no, rolls around in their uh, life. Uh, and that, we're, not getting, exactly. we're not getting excessive pressures. We're not getting any more pressure. We're not getting barrel wear. We're not getting any of the things that everyone said would happen. And it's, it, you just never done it. That's just what you think it's going to happen. Exactly. And that's where I was kind of going with, like, the game twist and the progressive twist. Because, like, on paper, academically, there would appear to be an academic benefit to why that – I can understand the idea – but every time it's been really, I think, explored or tried, there's been absolutely no quantifiable Im improvement to performance. You know, it, and no, you know, I, I think it's been debunked actually. Probably, yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I'm, I believe that too. Yeah. You know, I know that we had we had looked at some stuff because a couple of guys that really knew what they were talking about trying to sell me on this thing, and uh, I think we had gotten a hold of a prototype and i'm like yeah it was a few years ago i remember i can't remember who it was i was trying to sell it to us at the time yeah but, and, and i remember shooting this thing and i was like dude there's but the data does not support all yeah, the, what this, are they trying the 79 to page you know document you've submitted to us and like the act did like the, the the target doesn't say you're yeah. right yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it, yeah when it comes to dispersion and stuff that's really easy to you know prove or yeah, i'm not gonna get a shooting in a laboratory so yeah yeah that's where i wonder with you know, we talk about incremental improvements, and I think for most people when it comes to ammo and performance, number one, everybody wants everything all the time. But it's like, okay, well, how much energy does it have? And, and like, I even get to the point now I have to be careful because I'm just like, that's a stupid question. But like, energy where? Well, muzzle energy. Well, why do you want to know muzzle energy? Because, like, you're not going to contact shoot someone. Mm -hmm. Like, where do you think you're, like, what range are you going to, I want to be able to shoot to 1,000 yards. Oh, really? Okay, like what percentage of shots on human or animal targets is at a thousand yards? Like, why the fuck are we asking this? But well, like, we're, I showed you the five five six honey badger we're doing, and that's for a requirement that, that I'm kind of doing myself. Like I did sort of three hundred and then eight six, and it's like okay, a little five five six gun because they've been trying to do this thing kind of for a while. It's like what you really want is a four and a half pound gun that'll shoot this far and you're never going to shoot anybody farther than this with it. So let me tell you what the barrel length should be because we know what the bullet, yeah. we know what the round is already. Like that's already, you've got that. So 
your your what what's the longest engagement and where are ninety what what distance are ninety nine percent of the shots? Let me make you a gun for that. I mean, you're not hunting out to a thousand yards. I mean, unless you're I guess certain well, situations possibly. What, but. I, what, what I think is interesting to you that the difference between I think some of the commercial market the way they may look at projectiles, bullets, and performance, and the way other entities might look at the same thing, is that the forward thinking of it, right? So like whenever you talk to a civilian about like payload capacity of a bullet, that doesn't mean much because they're not trying to put a penetrator in that bullet down the road, you know, or some other type of payload in that bullet. Yeah. And so you start looking at things a little bit different where it's like, hey man, you know, like, th like this larger projectile can fit a much larger something and like, you know, and so you're, yeah. that's, that, that's the kind of stuff that gets lost. I think whenever people think of, uh, bullet development and, and, you know, other things, you know? Yeah. Well, like, so a thing with 8.6 is subsonic AP. Like, that's never been done before. Never and before. we're able to do that. And fast twist plays a part in that. But also having a big bullet does. Um, you know, think about, like, all these things that we've learned that I've never thought about sometimes don't mean anything. But people be like, oh, 8.6, it's all bullshit. The rotational velocity doesn't do anything because, you know, that's not how you measure uh, muzzle energy. It's like, well, we never calculated rotational velocity because all rifling was the same twist. Like everybody yeah, made yeah. a one in 10 for this cartridge or one in 14 for this cartridge. So it wasn't a factor. It's all the same. Yeah. And then, but think about this 16 inch 308, it goes like transonic, subsonic, 850, 900. Depend yards. on the barrel length, depend on atmosphere, depend on what, yeah, but it's right. somewhere around there. So yeah. Somewhere around there. So that's a full power, like let's call it 165 grain 308. Subsonic 8.6 can be 1,050 at the muzzle, and it'll be 950 at 1,000 yards. Damn. So wow. at 1,000 yards. Now, it's, why did I shoot 1,000 yards with subsonic? It's stupid. It's got 160 feet of drop. Okay. It's true. But, you know, these are the things that were uh, – it's, it's double the weight of a 308 bullet out of this, you know, and at 1,000 yards, you have higher muzzle, you have higher velocity. Not even rotational, but linear velocity. And so, like, tell me where you're going to – what distance are you going to shoot something? Yeah. And, no. and that's really what people need to be concerned with, which I don't think they ever consider. It's like, oh, muzzle velocity I and mean, muzzle energy tells you everything. Like, no, no, it doesn't. Uh, that's why I think it's great. Like tomorrow, Mission Ridges, I'm probably going to swing by and say what's up. Because I, I, you know, those are all, those are good friends of mine there. Yeah. And I want to come support you guys. I'm a, well, hope you have a, I hope you have a Q shirt big enough to fit my fat ass. I'm going to come up. <laughs> well, I think I should wear one of y'all shirts. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll, get, we'll come hang out, man. But it's great for people to have the opportunity to talk to the guy that designed the fucking thing and just simply ask why. And I think that even if you listen to some, listen to it for five minutes, you have a little bit deeper appreciation. I know that when I talk to students or I talk to people that are buying our guns and they ask why we did this, when they actually hear the why, they have a, a, bit, a little bit more appreciation of what it is. And, and you have a hell of a good why. You have a lot yeah. of good why stories, sir. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, it, you know, it's what I do. Even if I'm dealing with, you know, military government, well, why and what are you actually trying to do? And then when I deal with my engineers, it's what they ask me and it's what I ask them. You know, things on that gun, when they make a change, you know, we're developing the boom box about to go into production. It's almost done, but every change. Why? Why did you do that? What were the choices? What was going on? And you have an understanding of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't even, I don't follow any of it blindly. Like I've learned when I do that, it's generally the wrong thing. And if my engineers are doing the right thing, they can justify it to me. And if we're doing the right thing, like I'll be able to justify it to the customer. Yeah. Um, but it is amazing. Like social media. I love that Mike Tyson quote. Like got, what, what is the one about? Got y'all don't got too used to talking shit, not getting punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You see that commercial? There's some commercial they go around a guy's house and they're talking shit about boxers, and the boxer comes to the house and punches him in the face. Oh, like that. I could have taken that punch. I'm gonna find out. Both <laughs> 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 awesome. Jane, Tell and Bob, like we're from the internet. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. But, but the why matters, and I think there's room for all of it. And you know, like I love that Palmetto State makes guns. I love that Ruger makes guns. I love that you guys make the guns. The more guns we can get out there, the better. Yeah, right. I've said right. this. I've said this like every chance I get, man. I'll say it again on our own podcast. If if you look at Heller, if you look at like in common usage, I guarantee you Anderson has done more for in common usage than you and I ever will. Oh yeah, in definitely. terms of like the it's numbers of good, out, yeah. it, it, making it absolutely damn, you know, pretty much impossible to ban the AR based on the language of Heller. 
Well, whenever you know one company is making between five hundred thousand and a million fucking receivers a year, that's about as in common usage as it uh, gets. They've they, they right. made more, they made right. more receivers like, while we're sitting here than we make all week. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty guys. great. But so back to the why thing, I think that needs to be kind of highlighted a little bit more. I've mentioned this again on on the other podcast. Um, Richard Fitzpatrick had a saying. He said, "Build what they need, not what they want." It, it sounds very arrogant, right? It sounds kind of cocky. What he meant no, to say uh, was, like, let's let's go back to what you're saying is, I, do I need a thousand yard subsonic? No, yeah. but they asked for it. So, like, let's go back to what's realistic and develop a product that suits the need, the why, and not just. Well, you know, R- Richard was a brilliant guy. I mean, it shows. Like, he he developed a company from this stupid little rubber band right. thing that's done great things for our industry. But I think, you know, Henry Ford has a quote like that about the faster horse. Yeah, and yeah. Steve Jobs yeah, yeah, has yeah, a quote yeah, about exactly. I, So yeah. lots of successful people. Yeah. You realize, like, if I ask the Internet what I should build and, and I agree to do it and you guys do it, you're just going to make a shittier gun. And so am I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, right. oh, yeah, well, right. OK, I mean, well, that, you want a thousand dollar gun because that's what you can afford. And I love that. Like, I couldn't afford a thousand dollar gun when I started. Yeah. But, you know, aspirationally. And some people, all they need is a Smith & Wesson, MMP, whatever, cheap AR. And that's cool. I much prefer you have that than no AR. But if you start shooting and you can gain an appreciation for it and the attention to detail, like you said to me today, that last 5%, that's where all the money is. Yeah. That, that's where all the grit is necessary. That's where all the money is. Yeah. And it's easy for people to stop there because that's the difficult part. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what separates the, you know, the the... Hard use stuff from the casual use stuff is the last five percent, you know. Yeah, you're yeah. talking about you know, require you know, telling people, tell people what they need, you know. And I remember when we used to do all custom guns, people would walk in. The first question we'd ask them is like, "What are you going to use it for? Like, yeah, what are you right, doing? Right. Like, we'll tell you, like, give us the problem, and we'll tell you how to solve the problem." Right. You know what right. I mean? Well, no. That's yeah. that's absolutely the correct way to do it. Yeah. Tell most gun shops to do it, but they don't. You know, they're, 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 yeah, exactly. they're selling the but thing they want to move. So like, like, <laughs> like, like what Kevin was saying there earlier, though, it is true. Like the best years in my life for those first couple of years were like people would walk in and like we'll sit there and shoot the shit and build their gun on the spot. And like it was – it was just fun. It was like a, it was yeah. a hangout, you know. And yeah. all of a sudden, when the when the handbook finally came out, you're like, "Fuck, yeah. Yeah. it's gotten real." Yeah. 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 There's a couple of yeah. people anymore. It's in the handbook. Yeah. You gotta wear pants. <laughs> because I have, a, I have a couple of rules like that we won't ever do, and, and I understand. And I actually just separated our company this year. We have um, a factory. Um, because that needs to run a certain way, and that's not like in my nature, like operations. And then we have a creative facility, and the creative facility is where marketing and um, design engineering is. And they both have machine shops, and they run independently. And it's because of like culture things like this. And mm-hmm. as a company, suddenly, you know, you're struggling for years, and all of a sudden, you, you know, you get lucky, and the hard work's paying off, and you get over the little hump, and the company starts to grow, and you're like, oh, shit. And, you, have, you know, for me, I want my guns. One thing I love and where I see we're getting better, I go to the factory every day and we produce, you know, whatever. We might produce 200 fixed 308s today. And I go to the rack when those are done and I pick, I pick them up randomly. And they hate to see me coming over there, you know. I pick them up randomly and I, I might pick up five or six guns and I fuck with them, everything on them. And, it, you know, five years ago, oh, my God, I couldn't pick up a gun without finding something wrong. You know, when you're small and you're starting out, especially doing something new like fix. But now seeing the consistency of the guns where I can't tell 10 guns apart, like they're they're getting that good. And I was like, oh, man, I did the right thing by getting us the fuck out of this building because, yeah. you know, we have a COO and those people are assembly people just like y'all is downstairs. You can see how passionate they are. My guys want, so now when they come, like they all stop and they look and, and they expect that I'm not going to find anything wrong. And they're taking pride oh, yeah. in that, you know, we, having we, that we, culture there. And I can't get my design engineers like those, those guys. Oh my God, messy as hell. And just, but you know, it's <laughs> yeah, like yeah. not trying to fit them into that mold and let them be free thinkers. Putting, and putting the right people stuff. in the right places is important too. Yeah. You know it's I mean? it's like, a hard skill. Yeah. But, but, but it is. It's so important in running a company. The biggest thing in running a but, company is knowing like where to put people. You know, the, the guys here. You know, the armorer that built the gun has to sign the certificate that it ships with. The guy that inspected the gun has to do the same thing, and that like that's a level of personal ownership to where it's like if that gun goes out and it fails to perform, like it's not some anonymous 
thing. Yeah. It's like, right. oh, it was Bob. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, we'll make yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. send us a picture of the certificate to you. And we, yeah. we have like, uh, yeah. Who well, built this thing? I, yeah. I watched it today when I was down there when they were shipping some guns. And then when Jordan came over, it works with me. Right. I asked him about it. And he's like, man, I want to do the same thing. And he's like, I want to have a tag on it where everybody, because we do so much like in process QC and then sure, someone test yeah. fires the gun. Small batch kind All of stuff too, where you know if, if there was a, if you have this batch of springs, if there was an issue with that spring, yeah. you can identify it down to the small batch instead of like, yeah. oh fuck, it was somewhere in the last 8,000. Like, yeah, no, 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 right, right. But I told him, he was saying, I want everybody to have to sign that too. And he thinks it's meaningful for like at a retail. And I was like, I agree. And I was, and I was down there and I was like, you know what we're going to do? We're not even going to sign it. I'm going to get a little stamp like uh, of everyone's face. <laughs> and awesome. The person that did it is their, their face is going to be on that little gun. So that's awesome. like, I'm hoping they'll take even more ownership because, you know, I know my assembly guys, do, but you know, we got new people just started in shipping and they're the last QC check. Okay. Now you're going to have to stamp your face on that, on the tag on that gun. <laughs> hey, I love it, so, man. Yeah. If they, they, well, if I, if I contributed a little bit, one tiny you, thing to, you did. Hey, yeah, yeah. Dude, that's, that's the goal, man. Yeah, anyway, in, in the American, uh, the American shooter, the American gun owner benefits from all of this, all of this collectively, all the work that we all do, all of us that give a shit yeah. about the cause. You know, ultimately, we hope that the end user benefits. We raise yeah. the bar. You know, right? yeah. I, I mean, it's what drives me. It's certainly not. I don't want to be the biggest gun company, and I don't care to be the richest guy in the world. But, but I do care. You know, for me, the innovation. And, you know, my idea is like for my marketing, it's awareness for the company, but it is for our industry as well, you know, but I want to make the best stuff and I want to innovate, you know, and, and I think I told you last night, like the two companies when I started out that I loved were H&K and Knight's Armament. Like those are the two companies that inspired me to do what I do. And I still love the same things about H&K and I've been, you know, I spent two months in the factory in Germany. And, and Knight's Armament, I love, I love that company and things that they've done and approaches that they've taken. And I still, as much as I can, from the way that Reed and I really thought about giving guys a capability they don't even know that they need. And then H and K, like their commitment to just excellence in manufacturing. And I don't know, like what it's common now on Reddit or wherever about like I'm sure everybody hates H and K because they don't import the guns or whatever. But their culture in Germany and that factory. Like, it's no surprise that for decades they made the greatest guns on the planet. Yeah. H&K coming to a store near no one. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, not, that's not H&K's fault. That's the German government's fault. Yeah, you know? and they don't I mean, even want them there anymore. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. such a sad situation. I mean, so there's a, I think we shared this. There's a golden age of every rifle company. I think we're there. I think, I know, I know you're there. Where you're, you're big enough to fulfill the man to to deliver to see things through to actually you know do what you got to do but you're still small enough to give a shit you know to worry you, you know you, you still know the yeah. dude you can still walk through and you know everybody you know like you, yeah. you know, so there's a connection there okay, so you're 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 big enough to get the job done no matter what the job is but you're small enough to, to not have been so detached from the actual work you know well, I, I think it's different things and, and i know lots of um you know owners of gun companies and, and different things and I guess everybody cares in their own way. They have, they have their own motivations. Um, but I'm still so passionate about the product and what we do. Yeah. Like I, I don't, I care way more about it than I do money. And, and uh, like, I know my online persona and I see all the stuff that's written. Some, some guy on Reddit's going to be like, yeah, then your gun should be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can, yeah. I could make cheap guns. Well, that that's a whole nother story. But, the commitment to it and but what it takes for us to, to, to make the guns that we make. When we talked about, there's no common parts in a honey badger. No. Like everything on it is specialized. Oh and yeah. I can only imagine the R and D and the engineering and the prototyping and the fucking, you know, yeah. like I can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know. Well, we're yeah. talking about Stressful. like just what my engineering payroll was last night, you know? And at this point it's like, if I wanted money, I would get rid of engineering and everything. And I would just, make the fix just mass produce it and the honey badger like i don't need to r d or develop stuff anymore but it's the thing that drives me and i want you know i want us to be the the best gun company ever and i i think for me early on whether it was robert silvers or it's ethan lassard or nick schaefer i've always known that like i can't do it 
and I can't be the smartest guy in the room and I can't control everything at the company. Like I'm good at the innovation side and I'm good at the marketing and I need to stay the hell out of just about everything else. But I also know in those areas, I like my job really, like what I do for our company is recruit. Like I have to convince these guys to come work for me so I've, I've, I've brought a lot of talent in. <laughs> yeah. Well, even Elon Musk said, no, well, something he says, he talks about, he's like, I'm, you know, he's the same thing. He's, like, he's not the smartest guy. And he's like, I may not know how to do that, but I hired a guy from freaking MIT that does, right. you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and getting them to want to stay there. Because, um, you know, like all of my engineers could get jobs probably making more money at a whole number of gun companies. I know they get recruited all the time. I never fear losing one of my guys because when they come and they want to spend a million bucks on a 3d printer, like I've never told them no. And you, you know, they, they don't want us to just make the honey badger. They love the honey badger, but you know, to me, it, it's like somebody asked me, what's What's like the thing I'm most proud of. It's always the next thing we're going to do, Yeah. you know, and for them. So that's like, why do we do eight, six? All right. Well, we have this very interesting thing where we're going to, we don't know what all we're going to learn, but we're going to learn a ton. It's going to bring brand equity, but these guys are going to get so much smarter, and we're going to educate the rest of the industry in some way because nobody's going to chase like eight six or fast twist. Ammo companies won't even do it. Um, but having those guys, okay, let's make the boom box. Like, what's a hard thing to do? Like, the fixed rifle was maybe a mistake in the sense that now that I'm a little older and went through it, picking that as our first thing to do at Q. Oh my lord! There's a reason no one copies that gun. There's a reason. You know, nobody's going to go, if you can sell, you know, ARs and, and compact nine millimeter handguns, like there is no reason to go spend $8 million trying to new, develop a new bolt gun. Yeah. Like, why are you going to do that? All right. Well, the reason why is because it's hard and my guys get to do those things. And, and that's, you know, so it's almost like, well, like our R and D facility is, is like Kevin's summer camp for rich nerds. Like that's basically what it is. And then it's my, I, you know, like we, do these things come up with and it's my idea or it's my job then so i recruit these guys i got to keep them there keep them happy then i have to convince people that they need to buy these things that we do. well just so you know that that eight six step fixed that that is like the that's the first gun that i've been excited about in a long time and i normally don't like talk to my, i don't know like hey man i need to get one of those so yeah that thing's pretty fucking cool and for, and for someone like me i have a pretty high threshold for what i think is cool you know yeah. I, I see and I you're see, around it every day i'm yeah. around it every day i'm like okay i want i want one of those right <laughs> well thank you know i loved when when you asked for one I, I love it. because you know i mean that's cool we all make like cool stuff guns are cool i like all guns but yeah the, the fix is different and i you know that was six of us working on that gun it's not one guy that designed it and I funded the first three years of that thing and millions of dollars, but it is my favorite gun. Every day I pick that thing up and still seven years later, I, I finger that thing every day. I still shoot it a ton. It's all I hunt with really. I love that gun. I'm so proud of my team and the job they did on that gun. It's unbelievable. It's one of those rare things where it turns out better than you hoped. So yeah, thank you so much, I, and and I, and I love when people that that I know have a, a level of understanding can really appreciate it. Nah, we well, not a fucking home run, dude. Nah, I'm excited. You. I'm excited to get get some rounds on that thing. Well, dude, I think everybody else got, got come to the end here. Oh, awesome. Nick, it's good to finally hang out, man. Finally, like, it's been oh, years. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, we shot show and we talk on the phone like all the you time. But to, this you is... walked up and shot. I had no idea what you look like. I'm like, who the fuck? Are you? I know everyone thinks I'm a golden retriever. <laughs> oh man, hey, I thought yeah. I put a black it, box on your face during yeah, the exactly. yeah. no, It's, uh, it's been it. it's been too long, and this has been great, man. You guys got to come out to North Carolina. I, just got got let me know when I'll, I'll be out there. Their place is awesome. Did you know his partner was actually worked with me at advanced armament he was the co-designer with ethan wasard of the honey badger oh, oh wow. shit i didn't yeah. know that yeah. small world yeah. right yeah it, again it's again back to the history component when i look back people ask me who is reptilia i said do you own an ar-15 you own something we made it was at a different company it would have been yeah. aac or magpul or whatever but i'm looking around in this room here and i can see like eric did that I stuff you design on the wall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so yeah, as far as industrial us, design eric is the best in our industry yeah. by fucking mod. So the in terms of development, the perfect dream team is a guy like Ethan or Nick that does the engineering and Eric does the styling. 
they're perfect. Like, I mean, that's how awesome. we did the honey badger in two weeks because it was Ethan and Eric, and they didn't have wives or children at the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that doesn't exactly. with a lot of stuff. No, it's it's funny how much extra time you have to really throw yourself into your work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it turns out about yeah. a lot of free time these days. Yeah, so, so for me, you know, and, and it was interesting to Eric. Like, Eric is a brilliant kid. And industrial design. He's got a He's almost great now. <laughs> You guys, fuck you guys, man. You're always gonna be kids to me. We're old as shit. But, um, but you, you know, it's I don't know. It's it's like when I think of you guys, I think of you like when I met you guys and you were right out of college I, I and know. stuff. You know, I was but, probably your age. <laughs> oh God! But um, now, now I'm just gonna reminisce and get all sad. It's not that we're young; it's that you're old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Not even exactly. Guys, I'm like an old guy, but. Um, Oh, but you know what Eric did? So he designs that mount, and th this is to his credit, which I think is awesome. Maybe he wouldn't even want me to say, but so he comes to visit Ethan and my engineers to say when he did the one piece mount, he's yeah. like, "Here's what I've done from an engineering perspective. How can I make it better?" Right. And he has like a really brilliant mind for engineering already. Yeah. And there was only like a couple of things, like minor things, and to his credit, like he listened. Right. And, and, and Ethan has got the biggest ego in the world, and he's very difficult, our engineer. But he's usually right. Right. And he was right about he those right. things. And, you know, and you guys have produced to me the best scope mount. I, I oh, fucking love you. that thing. That's thank all you. that I use. Yeah. And, it, and it is better because Eric, you know, was able to set his ego aside and yeah. say, before I press go, what do you guys think? But that's the thing. Like with Ethan, he trusts him implicitly. Yeah. So there was no question he was going to do that. Yeah. No, so, good, you know, it was team. funny because I remember it had two recoil logs. And Ethan's like, Eric, you know better. Why the fuck would you put two yeah. recoil logs? Because only one can ever touch at a time. Yeah. So it, it's like stupid to have more than one. And he's and I remember Eric said, and Eric knew, but he was like, he kind of embarrassed. he's like, well, it's kind of the industry standard. And Ethan yeah. was like, it's fucking stupid. Don't be stupid. Right. And so he did remove <laughs> yeah, it. Did and remove I mean, it, it yeah. was it was right. So like thinking in, in those terms. Um, that was one thing where the barrel length on like my sales guys, like Jordan was one of them. When I told him we we're going to do five, five, six honey badger. And I want to know what they said. And I said, okay, guys, what barrel length? They're like, Oh, 11, five can't be shorter than 10, three said, okay, you guys tell me why it can't be shorter than 10, three industry standard rule of thumb, two things they said. And I died laughing and told them, shut the fuck up. And it's like, Jesus. explain to me why it's 10-3. And they didn't know. So I said, okay. And I said, here's the thing. I said, well, nobody else. I said, no, your job is to sell stuff. My job is to market things. We're going to go with a faster twist. So we're going to get the performance of a longer barrel, but we're going to have a shorter, lighter gun. Why would you not want that? Right. Like, give me a good argument for that. So it's even with our sales and stuff, it's it's like a process of educating them on, yeah, yeah it's what everyone else does. And if it's the right thing, we do it. And if it's not the right thing, then we don't do it. We, right. we started looking at that, not just in terms of the, the fires. I want I want everything that we do to be data-driven. I want to be able to, I want to, if someone asks me a question, I want to be able to explain it in such a way that it is not because, well, we, because we say it is. Like, yeah, you know, right. But not just in the construction of the weapons, but even in the even in the way that you do business. You know, I mean, like I started looking at some of the way we did stuff as far as traveling, some of the trade shows, some of the other stuff we did, and you realize like some of these things are good ideas and some of them are bad, but you do them like that because that's the way they've always, always been done. done. It's and like I'm trying to think like, yeah. wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a better way to do this. I actually can't wait for Shot Show to collapse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, there's such a better think. way of doing it. I mean, we spent, what, a quarter million dollars almost? I that, mean, that's that ridiculous. You know, the best you Shot know, Show was the one was two years ago, right after COVID, because there was like half as many people there. Right, yeah, like, all empty. the people that weren't supposed to fucking be there right. weren't there. They weren't there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Honestly, for a quarter million dollars, I would love to either go fly around and visit some of our, you know, fun strategic friends, you know, or fly them all here and throw a fucking party and have some of our buddies Dude, play so a concert we're, we're or never, something. We're never we're like, shot. Like, we're up in our room in the yeah. whole time. Yeah, like, I mean, talk to RSR. Um, they said that uh, the trend right now is all the bigger vendors just come visit before shot. Like, even sometimes before the end of the year, just knock it out before Christmas, and then we're done. And they slap five at the, the show and don't even talk. Dude, yeah, we're, we're constantly like, flying to Brownells, flying to wherever. Well, you know, saying, but take, take some of our guys fishing. I mean, like, that sounds like a hell of a cool... I mean, you know, that sounds like a hell of a lot better than, like, let's go to the yard bird and let me buy some fucking... <laughs> I know, right? Africa with waffles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and deals will get done. In Africa. I mean, think about how many deals are done on a golf course between, yeah. you know, yeah. big companies. 
Right. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Shot show doesn't make any sense to me in the terms of you're competing with everyone. Like yeah. I, I, I would rather not. And you're right when you spend quarter minute because I just I got so frustrated with shot years ago. So hey, see, then I did it with Q once. I would throw yeah. a quarter of a million dollar party. I just have a like crazy party. Yeah. yeah. And it was to me, it was a customer appreciation. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Don't get me wrong, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like okay, all the other stuff I can do videos and post or come see me or or whatever. I mean, heck, you know, it's interesting. Like, I don't ever want to get to the point when I was talking about Mission Ridge tomorrow. Like, I'll be there. There's no reason for me to be there. It's yeah, fun. But, I, yeah, it's fun. But I want to hear people. But, you know, like social media. Like, I'll take a bunch of shit because I'll tell people to shut the fuck up or whatever. Like, you say something <laughs> stupid. But, oh, Kevin is so unprofessional. He's such a douche. Okay, well, why don't you DM Ron Cohen that is a CEO of SIG or... Name a company. Um, uh, yeah, at least I'm here to call you. Mess, 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 yeah. Message them and see what they say to you. So am I? A, I'm a bigger douchebag for telling you something you don't want to hear, or that guy for not responding to you, or I don't know. I have all these thoughts now. All of a sudden, now that we're trying to wrap this up, yeah, because it was a thing too. I'm starting this whole like kind of um, documentary series thing because I started to realize because I know like you guys are dead air fans and all. And like God bless them, they sell silencers. But well, we, we we all come we all came up together a little bit, man. They're, yeah. they're, you know, so. so they you know have a company and they have a little place where they design stuff and then they source build it, but they don't do the QC and all, and it ships out and everything. But like you know, like their degreed engineer is like a manufacturing engineer or something. He's not a mechanical engineer, which you don't have to be. Eugene Stoner wasn't mechanical engineer. I don't think Browning was either. However, it's like looking at what we go through, like our testing and our quality control and all the stuff, the millions of dollars that I spend to develop a product and, you know, the accountability that I have for it, it's like, we're not the same companies. You know, like I'll have, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of rounds of eight, six will shoot before anyone ever gets a gun, you know, and, and things like this, the data, when I told you we're doing the five, five, six honey badger, oh, it's simple. Just put a five, five, six. No, it's not. And we'll shoot, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of rounds we'll end up shooting, but every round already, every single one is on high speed video, every single round, you know, you know what that cost. And it's like, yeah, there's a difference in the companies when you start doing these sorts of things. And it's like with social media, that's a thing where you can get, you know, you can market a certain way. And then the consumers think that the companies are the same and there's room for everyone. And I like that, but you know, so I'm going to start just showing what we're doing and then people can ask like i see all the stuff that you're doing down there and all and i you know oh yeah all, all you guys do is buy parts and assemble I'm like bullshit like it's bullshit right. and there's so many different levels to all this like that is not what goes on here and how do you show this like differentiate your brand yeah. and the yeah. things that you're and good the, at and the other fucking problem with it dude it's a giant frustration for me to the point where like it, it, it's ruined a couple of my dinners from having read comments and stuff like that. Oh, right? yeah, you know I mean? yeah. But but out of industry etiquette, I have to bite my tongue because there's plenty of times where someone makes some kind of like comparison, and I would love. I've seen behind the curtain, man. Yeah. I know it. Oh, yeah. I've seen behind the curtain, and I've done this for years. Where I could tell you where every, I could tell you a lot about the the the, the person you're making some kind of bizarre. You know, about industry etiquette, you know, I, I, I don't. I'll tell you what, though. I mean, I wonder. I'll tell you if if somebody takes the first whack, then I, you know, I'll, I'll happily respond. If they want to invite right. me to the to the shit throwing contest, I'll bring a fucking catapult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, most people don't do it, and so I, I get where it, it turns some people off and it's a brace. But, but you know what I hate is like you can hate me for being a dick or calling you out, but. Companies misleading consumers are yeah. lying to consumers pisses me off, and it should piss you off if you're the consumer. Yeah, right. Like I shouldn't be the asshole. It's the asshole that's not being honest with. You. Look, look I, I don't, I don't judge anybody. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do this. I mean, like I've made a, I made kind of a pact with myself, you know, for how I respond to some of this stuff. Which, but with that being said. Uh, at some point, you reach a level of frustration just from, like, reading bullshit or reading, oh, like, yeah. oh, that's not fucking true. Or, like, you know, right. you can't do that. Like, you know, or, the, you know, or like, all right, fuck it then. You know, like, I mean, I, I totally understand where it comes from when someone does, though. I, I, I get it, you know? So, yeah. I don't know. People get passionate about a brand or whatever. I want to be loyal to that. Like, 
I, I don't I, understand sometimes. I don't understand some of the emotional attachment to certain things where, like, you know, they want to fight you over it. Yeah. I mean, you know, people used to give some of our fans a hard time because – because they, you know they you know they were very supportive and loyal to our brand. But what they don't realize is how many hours mm-hmm. I've spent on the phone. I, I give my cell phone number out on Reddit. Yeah. I get on ARFCOM, whatever. A lot of these people I've spoken to. I've yeah. helped them work their problem. They call me at night. Oh. And go, what, what, what buffer <laughs> should I use? Well, I mean, there's I don't I can't think of many other companies that have that level no. of accessibility with the guy that fucking designed the gun. No, yeah, um, and, and stupid not to appreciate it. But I, but the thing is, if you don't respond in a way they like, like you're such a dick. But it's like, okay, well, buy a gun from Ruger or in, in, you know, even smaller companies, and call, call the guy that owns it. Yeah, no, no. you're getting you're probably getting a lot of dick. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, you know, how about this? You call me, and I'll give you his cell phone numbers. <laughs> like, right. Exactly. And it will really seem to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I like it. No, it's, it's true. Well, yeah. You want to take us out, man, dude? Yeah. Hey, guys, thank you for joining us, the SLGW podcast. Uh, Keep following us. We're going to try dropping one a week every uh, every Monday at four o'clock is the plan. So four I, four a.m. By the way, for those. Well, yeah, this, so, so far, so far, I think this has been my favorite one. Yeah. <laughs> this has probably been my favorite podcast we've done, and uh, having a blast, guys. Uh, hey, any questions for? If there's any questions for Nick over at Reptilia, if there's any questions for uh, Kevin from Q, you know, Kyle or myself, leave them in the comments. Like and share. I, I help us get the word out because I mean, obviously, you guys know that the social media platforms squelch and bury the shit out of gun companies' uh, right. content. Oh, yeah. Guys, help us out. Help share, like, subscribe, recommend. And if you like this kind of content, man, we're going to keep it coming. We have a long list of good buddies that we can't wait to introduce y'all to. So, yeah, thanks, yeah, guys. I'll thanks, respond. Guys. Thanks. Yeah, man. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Sweet. All right. Uh, you want to sign the wall? Yeah, yeah man, good, man. Fuck yeah, dude. Dude, that was great. It was okay. Oh, oh man. I, 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 I was. Thanks for joining us today right here at the Liberty Tree Studio. But be sure to visit us at solgw.com for hard-use blasters, badass swag, and much, much more.